This happened to me a few summers ago, back when I used to work in the Pine Barrens, New Jersey. My name is Caspin Fry, and I was there to supervise a team of researchers from the university. Despite being in such a desolate area, something felt familiar. The smell of the forest soil, the gentle sound of the wind through the trees, and above all else, a mysterious sense of homecoming. While having dinner one night, I started sharing childhood memories with my colleagues when Silas Blythe, our project leader, chimed in. You reminded me of this creepy story my grandpa used to tell me about a creature that lurks in these woods, Silas said, pausing as he sipped his coffee. The group leaned in closer as Silas described this supposedly ferocious animal-like creature that preyed upon unsuspecting wanderers. We laughed it off since none of us believed in superstitions. With our hearts full and humor light, we headed to bed. Days passed smoothly until the evening Leonora Winthrop went missing. Leonora was sent to collect samples near the predetermined research zone but never returned. The next morning, we found her backpack shredded by deep gashes. Its contents were scattered around what appeared to be the kill site. Panic set in amongst the team members as they called for help while I stood frozen by horror. Without cell reception and unable to radio out due to interference, we had no choice but to continue our search for Leonora on foot. The trail led us deeper into the woods where Pavita Thurston discovered a sickening sight. Human remains gnawed through with malice, a spectacle that stifled even our most seasoned research member. We huddled together that night discussing our next move, cutting our investigation short or pushing forward with only fear and uncertainty accompanying us. It was near dawn when we heard footsteps outside our tents. Everyone sat still with bated breath until Silas finally bravely announced, Guys, I'm going out to see what it is. We watched from the shadows of our tents as Silas moved cautiously towards the source of the noise. In the faint moonlight, we saw something sprint past Silas in a blur. Seemingly spooked but believing it was just a wild animal, Silas walked back towards us. The realization that something terrible was stalking us began to sink in, and we knew we had no choice but to fathom that old legend for our survival. While hastily packing our belongings, Pavita pointed through a tree clearing towards a hulking, non-human shadow lurking near the edge of our campsite. It had four legs with long claws at its feet. Its fur was patchy, and its eyes glinted like silver bullets. A paralyzing fear gripped us as the monstrous creature wandered off into the thicket, raising my concern about Silas' latest scouting expedition. Just as we finished loading our gear onto the truck, Silas went missing. A blood-curdling scream resonated through the forest. We knew it belonged to poor Silas now another victim lost to this enigmatic creature's vicious wrath. Panic sprawled over the team as they scrambled to climb onto the vehicle and escape their looming fate. The sound of snapping branches and growling signaled that our cunning predator was not far behind us now. My heart pounded painfully against my chest while Pavita gradually lost control of her sanity in trepidation. We rapidly tried evading destruction by bounding through dense foliage and crashing against nature's rubble-like landscape. Despite our best efforts to flee this diabolical beast, an unforeseeable force overturned the truck, leaving us entirely vulnerable amongst morning's chill air. As I lay among ashes, gasoline, and debris, I realized I didn't have much time left. The creature that had mercilessly slaughtered my companions lurked nearby, waiting for the right moment to strike and take my life as well. But something stirred deep in me, a burning desire to survive, to escape this nightmare and live another day. I picked myself up, ignoring the pain that shot through my body. There was no time to think, no time to feel sorry for myself. I called out to the remaining teammates 
searching for any sign of them. Some had run off into the woods in their fear, while others were still pinned beneath the wreckage. It was clear that we needed help, and fast. But with no phone signal in this remote area, we had no choice but to keep moving. The monstrous creature emerged from behind a tree, picking its teeth with a sharp claw as it eyed us menacingly. I knew it wouldn't be long before it came for me or anyone else still alive. Zachary and Tovita emerged from the brush, their faces flushed and fear shining in their eyes. We managed to free two more team members from the wreckage, but Silas was gone, and we could only assume the worst. With four of us together now and severely limited options, running seemed like our best chance for survival. The creature began to close in on us with ravenous anticipation written across its face. As we leaped over fallen trees and pushed through tangled vines, I couldn't help but think of all the strange stories of creatures stalking these forests, stories I had written off as mere myth before today. But now, chased by one of those supposed myths myself, skinwalker or shapeshifter or whatever else, I could no longer ignore the facts that were staring me right in the face. We stumbled upon a tiny abandoned cabin deep in the woods. Its rotting wooden exterior seemed weak yet unstable enough to buy us some time against our beastly assailant. The Vita hastily secured the door while Zachary and one of our other injured teammates frantically searched the cabin for weapons or anything that could help. Just as Pavita finished barricading the door, our predator slammed against it with a howl of rage. The door quivered, threatening to give way, and I knew it wouldn't hold long. In a desperate attempt to do something useful, I lit the cabin's old fireplace to signal for help. Zachary returned with makeshift weapons for each of us. A rusty pipe, a rusted axe, a broken table leg studded with nails. As the door splintered open, and the creature leaped in, we stood our ground, knowing that we could not fight back. Our malicious attacker wasted no time charging at us. It clawed at Zachary's chest before he could react, his screams echoing throughout the small space as he collapsed in pain. Pavita tried to attack but was swiftly thrown against the wall, leaving her dazed and unable to fight any further. It lunged at me next, those silver bullet eyes burning into mine. With no other options left, I swung my weapon, striking it in the head as best as I could muster before collapsing under its weight. Our final teammate managed to land a few solid blows on the creature, causing it to recoil momentarily. Taking that fleeting opportunity, we gathered ourselves and each other. Together we fled out through the shattered cabin door, bloody and battered but alive. We didn't stop running until daylight clawed its way through the forest canopy. It took all our strength just to make it back to civilization. Our injuries were severe, and we were heartbroken by the loss of Silas and those who couldn't make it out of the overturned truck. But the ordeal wasn't over yet. Everyone wanted answers about what had happened, but none of us had any to give. As days bled into weeks and later months, we continued our lives, forever haunted by the nightmares of that terrible experience. We never discovered the real identity of our attacker or whether it was truly a skinwalker or shapeshifter stalking those woods. Some mysteries, it seems, will remain unsolved. And as I sit here with my patched-together body as a living testament to the horrors we faced, I can't help but wonder if that cursed creature is still out there somewhere, waiting to claim more victims one day. While I did not seek answers or confront the tormentor that had tried to kill us all, a darkness lingers always on the edge of my thoughts, a reminder of that monstrous terror I barely escaped. This happened to me a while ago, 
right before I took shelter from the pouring rain under the thick canopy of trees in Carson National Forest, New Mexico. I'm Clyde Orborn, an outdoorsman and adventure seeker. A series of unexplained events started right after I met Ermintra Giles, a fascinating forester who shared with me the legend of strange disappearances in these woods. Just days later, the local sheriff requested our help in finding Roscoe Nunez, a missing hiker. As we searched for him together, we stumbled upon something gut-wrenching, a cold and lifeless body with unnatural bite marks. Feeling uneasy, I hesitated at first to share my suspicion that a monstrous creature was at large. Some nights passed before the whispers around town intensified. There was definitely something lurking here. They called it the Bone Breaker, or so the story went from father to son. The creature hunted humans but vanished between generations. I decided to take action and gathered a search team that included Ermintrud and our new acquaintance Soren Brabson. We scoured through the thick forest foliage under the moonlit sky, looking for any traces of this ominous creature. As we walked deeper into the woods armed with guns and hunting knives, our conversation lightened the mood with laughs and exchanges of amusing anecdotes. But suddenly, we came across tracks in the mud, tracks unlike those of any known animal in these parts. My heart pounded as we followed them cautiously. The sounds of nature gradually diminished, replaced by eerie silence. Soon enough, we heard heavy breathing emerging from behind a thick growth of bushes. These were events no man could forget. The scent still fills my nostrils burning wood mixed with blood-curdling terror. The swiftness and intensity shook us to our core as we watched this vicious creature reveal itself from the shadows. In all its gruesome glory stood a figure of nightmares, tall and muscular, with elongated arms ending in cruel claws. Coarse fur concealed its repulsive face, displaying a snout full of razor-sharp teeth dripping with saliva, an unspeakable version of devastation. Before we could react, it roared and charged us in a swift instance. Its talons ripped through the flesh of my arm as I barely escaped its grasp, firing my gun into its imposing form. The creature screeched loudly. I'd wounded it. As we backed away cautiously, Amintra dropped her firearm, startled by the rage of the beast. Desperation consumed her eyes as she realized the danger surrounding us all. I won't let you take another life, she screamed wildly at the creature. The monster didn't attack. Instead, it closed its eyes and breathed heavily. Was it in pain? Ermintrud stared it down before turning to me with urgency. Clyde, she whispered harshly. Roscoe is still out there somewhere. I have to save him. Panic settled in as I helped Soren up who had been knocked down by the massive force of the creature's charge. We debated whether to risk moving forward or retreat and gather reinforcements, but an agonizing scream echoed through the forest from afar. Our hearts raced with fear and adrenaline as we knew we had to act quickly, unable to fathom what horrors awaited us deeper into the treacherous woods. We couldn't waste any more time. Armintra darted into the woods, and Soren and I followed close behind. We scurried through the dense forest, pain and fright fueling our steps. The vile creature let out a blood-curdling squeal that echoed through the trees, prompting us to quicken our pace. As we hurried further into the unknown, I felt something brush against my leg, a cell phone. Quickly snagging it from the ground, I glanced at the screen. It was Roscoe's. Armintrud! I called to her. I found Roscoe's cell phone. Her eyes widened with determination, and we pushed on through the forest, frantically calling his name between heaving breaths. The creature continued its pursuit, spots of blood marking its path where my gunshot had left a wound. 
In a brave attempt to increase our chance of survival, Soren suddenly veered off to the left, drawing the creature's attention away from us as he yelled obscenities in its direction. With both a new sense of hope and dread sinking in, we realized this could be our last chance to find Roscoe alive. Soon enough, we stumbled upon a small clearing with Roscoe lying there motionless. Blood had stained his clothes. It was apparent that he'd been mauled by the monster. No! Our mentored cried as she dropped to her knees beside him. She tried calling for help on Roscoe's phone but discovered it was out of service. There was no reception deep within the woods. With reluctance and pain clouding her eyes, Armintrud agreed with me that our best course of action would be to leave him in this makeshift haven and search for help beyond the tree lean. Just as we began our retreat towards safety, a horrifying howl rang out again. Soren must have reached his limit. Fear and despair clawed their way into our minds, propelling us forward with as much speed as our battered bodies could muster. We were growing weaker by the second. Out of nowhere, Ermintrud stopped abruptly, causing me to collide with her. Just ahead of us, we saw Soren's limp body tossed from the trees and land with a sickening crunch. The monstrous beast emerged then, blood smeared across its snout. In a desperate attempt to defend ourselves, I grabbed the nearest rock and hurled it at the creature, striking it in the head. As it roared angrily, Armintrud tackled it and stabbed its wounded side with a jagged stick she'd found on the ground. The creature thrashed about in pain as it tried to shake her off. It suddenly collapsed to the ground, catching all of us off guard. As I stood paralyzed, my mind raced. What had caused the creature's unexpected fall? Our mintred panted heavily while still gripping her crude weapon tightly. In that moment of confusion and salvation, we assessed the following. The creature must have been a shapeshifter or akin to something like a skinwalker based on the myths we had heard from others before coming here. However, we dared not investigate further. We knew nothing about these legends nor this monstrous thing before us. All that mattered was getting back to civilization and proper care for our wounded friends. As swiftly as our injured states allowed, we exited the treacherous woods and soon emerged onto a road where several cars passed by. Flagging one down wasn't easy as many drivers regarded our bloodied figures with caution. At last, an older gentleman pulled over and cautiously helped us into his car. While he drove us toward town in search of medical assistance, neither Amintra nor I could find words to express our thoughts. We grieved silently for Roscoe and Soren, the friends we couldn't save, as we stared blankly out the window, recalling their faces in happier times. The nightmare that had consumed us had finally ended, and yet we still felt its gnarled claws haunting our hearts. For now, survival would have to suffice. This happened to me a while back when I visited a secluded cabin in the dense woods of Idaho. My name is Marcus Radcliffe. I took refuge in nature to escape city life and heal from a divorce. With me were my friends Rylan Whitlock and Livia Roscoe. The cabin was owned by an old friend of my father, Damon Varley, who'd gone missing. In our search for firewood, we stumbled upon a gruesome scene— the mangled corpse of a hiker. Shaken, we returned to the cabin, unsure if we should call for help given our unreliable phone signals. A terrible storm sealed our misfortune, heavy rainfall, lightning strikes illuminating pitch darkness. The wind tore branches from trees. Mudslides threatened the only way out. We couldn't call for help. Cell phone reception dipped with every passing moment. That evening, we discussed our options over Ken's soup, survival essentials among home-cooked meals prepared earlier. 
Livia wanted to leave at first light. Ryland suggested waiting out the storm. I tried to ease tension with light-hearted banter, joking about my flawed cooking skills. The storm raged louder outside as we slept that night to prepare for the decisions that morning will bring. Suddenly, Livia's blood-curdling scream jolted Rylan and me awake. We rushed into her bedroom and found it empty. A broken window shard hinted something was amiss. Adrenaline surging through our veins, Rylan and I decided to venture out, equipped with flashlights and hunting rifles. No luck finding Livia inside. The woods felt harsher. Twisted tree branches glared down menacingly as lightning provided a strobing effect on the treacherous ground. Following unrecognizable footprints in mud led us to a blood-spattered scene just beyond the cabin's perimeter. Livia's lifeless form sprawled on damp leaves as erratic scratches adorned her limp limbs. She was beyond rescue. Fear gripped us. Our predicament turned sinister when we spotted large, vicious claw prints nearby. This wasn't the work of human hands. Amidst the torrential rain and a sharp chill in the air, Rylan and I stood cautiously as the creature lurked nearby, unseen but ever-present. Time was of the essence. We needed to evacuate before it claimed us, too. Weapons in hand— we trekked through sodden earth to parse together an escape route amidst this living nightmare. Hours of hopelessness passed haunted by the inevitability that the creature could strike at any moment. A putrid stench preceded the sighting of our pursuer, a brutish creature with razor-sharp teeth, bristly hair covering its muscular frame, and claws perfect for tearing into prey. It bore no resemblance to any known animal. It triumphed over brutal wilderness. The creature lunged towards Rylan with superhuman speed and agility, tearing into his flesh like butter, blood sprayed like bitter raindrops over leaves. Terrified and alone now in my fight for survival, I emptied rounds at the beast to no avail. Rylan's screams echoed through the forest landscape as I backed away, stumbling over tree roots. The creature ignored the onslaught of bullets and continued to target Rylan, tearing into him with animalistic hunger. I fumbled with my phone, desperate to call for help but my fingers slipped. Rain drenched everything. Rylan looked at me, eyes pleading. Run! Save yourself! His voice choked as blood cascaded down his face. Glancing at the mangled cabin that serves no protection anymore, I noticed our satellite phone crushed by a fallen tree, an act of raw power from this brutal creature. The fading signal on my cell phone vanished, rendering it useless. I grieved for my lost friends and knew that calling for help wouldn't save them, but maybe it would save me. With tears mingling with the rain, I reluctantly broke eye contact turning on my heel and running. Flashes of Livia's body sprawled on the ground haunted me, fueling an urgency to escape. The creature snarled one last time before focusing its attention back at Rylan. It wanted to finish its meal. Branches clawed at my face as I sprinted through the dense undergrowth. It wasn't long before the sound of Rylan's agonized cries extinguished. Only the pounding rain remained nature's cruel ambience for this grisly affair. I didn't know how long or how far I had been running when I stumbled upon a road cutting through the woods. Civilization. My heart pounded in anticipation. Maybe there was hope if only someone would ever locate Livia and Rylan. I flagged down a passing truck, drenched and shivering from a combination of chilling rain and fear. The driver eyed me warily but empathetically allowed me inside his vehicle where I explained the barest details of my horrific encounter. He offered to drive me straight to the nearest police station and warned against going back to confront the monster. As we drove, I tried to recall what I knew about the creature and wondered if it was a skinwalker or some type of shapeshifter. 
but given my lack of knowledge in folklore and inability to fully identify the creature's species, all I could do was share what I knew with law enforcement and hope they could find an answer. At the police station, I worded my statement as convincingly as possible emphasizing that a wild animal had attacked us. The sergeant assigned several officers to search the cabin immediately hoping to save Rylan if by any stroke of luck he still clung to life. Days slowly passed as the investigation continued. The authorities ruled Livia's death as due to an unknown predator attack while Rylan remained missing. Searching the wooded area for the treacherous creature had yielded no results. It seemed like it simply vanished. The painful memory of losing Livia and Rylan haunted me always. I knew deep down inside that their lives would never be replaced. Whatever that terrifying creature was remained a mystery. Perhaps an uncharted forest dweller, never meant to interact with humans. A solemn year later, I returned to their burial sites with grieving loved ones, laying flowers on their graves in memory of their vibrant spirits. In crucial moments, they had protected me from whatever lurked in those woods, ensuring my survival while sacrificing themselves with unmatched loyalty and love. Life moved forward, but our past remained forever engraved in these woods. A story whispered throughout our town recounting our encounter with the unknown and honoring the heroic friends who fell victim to a horrific fate. This happened to me a few summers ago in Green Bank, West Virginia. I had decided I needed a break from the city and settled upon this isolated region in my quest for silence. My name is Harrison Wexler, and I'm a struggling writer trying to connect with my inner artist. Upon arriving, I discovered my temporary home was nestled among dense woods. The locals were few, and I befriended one by the name of Sheldon Hargrove. He was a gruff man, living alone but he welcomed me. He shared how people came here to escape modern technology since receiving signals were futile in a radio-quiet zone. Despite my love for isolation, an uneasiness crept into my mind as a newspaper headline captured my attention. Five missing, search unfruitful. Adrenaline surged through me as the unnerving story unfolded. Local authorities seemed baffled with this newest addition to an ongoing string of disappearances. Over the course of two weeks, strange incidents piled up. One morning, I found large scratch marks on my cabin door accompanied by an indescribable odor that clung to the wood like a starving leech. No native creature could have left such scratches. I voiced these concerns with Sheldon and showed him the door as evidence. He scratched his head uneasily but offered nothing more than speculation on wild animals or some sick prankster. It wasn't until our trip into the woods that we encountered the horrifying truth. We were tracing our way back when heavy footfalls neared us from behind. Sweat dripped down my brow as I peeked over my shoulder. What I saw defied reasoning. My heart raced as we stared down an abomination of nature, part man, part beast, with strands of matted hair cascading over rippling muscles. This predator towered above us with snarling teeth and blood-red eyes that glinted with malevolence. There was no time for a single logical thought. We bolted through the woods, the sound of its heavy breathing pounding in our ears. Our desperation lent us speed, and I managed to fire off a round from my revolver, but it was like shooting into air. We stumbled out onto the highway where passing motorists could see us. We collapsed against my car, gasping for air as whatever had chased us seemed to stop just beyond view. We watched the woods, now fully aware of the sinister reality that lurked within. Instead of calling for help, we opted to stay silent. What would others think of such a tale? 
It was laughable and terrifying all at once. Our lives took an uncertain turn as paranoia settled over Green Bank. We remained inside our homes, too fearful to venture into the darkness haunted by the unspeakable beast. Were we becoming prisoners in our own oasis away from civilization? The creature continued to torment us, weaving a web of horror that stretched across generations. Each night brought new surprises, from haunting screeches echoing through the quaint town to mutilated corpses discovered at its fringes. The monster's horrific acts resembled performance art or grotesque installation pieces, designed to chill the souls of anyone gazing upon them. As silence reigned over Green Bank once more, whispers circulated among the locals, each story more gruesome than the last. It became impossible for even Sheldon and me to ignore the troubling theories that implicated us as having something to hide. The grainy truth started fermenting like abandoned moonshine barrels when my dear friend Sheldon turned up missing one night, disappearing without a trace just as mysteriously as he had entered my life. I committed myself relentlessly in search of answers about my friend's fate discovering impossibly twisted trails that led further into darkness with each step. With every foray into those haunted woods, I grew closer to confronting him again, the nameless nightmare that terrified and dominated our lives. Inescapable fear and dread wrapped around me like a suffocating fog, my desperate search eating away at my already threadbare sanity. Each gunshot echoed as gun smoke filled air, leaving a bitter aftertaste in my mouth. Time dragged painfully as if to mock me in this unending nightmare. With the town paralyzed by fear, we tried our best to carry on with our daily lives despite the ever-growing threat. Businesses closed earlier, children played indoors, and everyone locked their doors as soon as darkness fell. The creature remained elusive, leaving only destruction in its wake and those who ventured out late at night risked a gruesome fate. Desperate for answers about Sheldon's disappearance, I decided to confide in Maggie, his sister. We sought out safety in numbers, staying together, and even sharing a room at night. One evening, while huddled under the dim light of a single candle, I shared my suspicions concerning the creature that I believed was responsible for the murder and mayhem plaguing Green Bank. I don't know what it is, I admitted to her hesitantly. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. It's a monster. It's fast, murderous, and appears to have some ability to change its form. Maggie listened intently, contemplating my words for a moment before suggesting we try something drastic, calling in outside help. But even that idea seemed futile, who would come to help a tiny town like Green Bank? Who would believe our increasingly strange story? We ultimately decided against seeking external assistance, instead choosing to rely on one another until we could no longer do so. Only days later did another attack on unsuspecting locals force us to reconsider our predicament. A young couple had been killed by the creature on the edge of town their bodies mauled and left unrecognizable. Interrupting my restless sleep that night came an urgency within me that compelled me to confront this entity directly. It seemed foolish at first why would a common man like me dare take on such a malicious being. But perhaps there lay my advantage. It wouldn't expect resistance from someone like me, someone very much aware of their insignificance. I walked through the silent house, pausing to look at Maggie as she slept peacefully, completely unaware of my decision to face the creature. I took a deep breath and stepped into the darkness outside. Each footstep felt heavier than the last as I followed the vague path to where I believed the creature would strike next, my senses heightened almost supernaturally. The night was eerie quiet. But even that couldn't mask the chilling truth. I had become prey. As it emerged from behind a nearby tree, it was all I could do not to freeze in pure terror. 
The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen, muscular with grotesque features that seemed to morph before my eyes. Perhaps it was a skinwalker or shapeshifter. There was no way for me to be certain. But somehow, against all odds, I felt an inexplicable surge of courage and determination. With furious adrenaline coursing through me, I charged at the creature with a yell. It looked at me with an almost human-like grin before revealing its horrifying sharp teeth and lunging toward me. Our battle lasted what seemed like hours, though it was undoubtedly mere moments. Just when I thought I would succumb to defeat and certain death, something unexpected occurred. Suddenly, screams rang out in the distance and bright lights pierced through the shadows of the woods. The creature's snarls were quickly replaced by howls of pain as its attention diverted from me. My insane attempt had drawn attention. Brave townspeople banded together in unified desperation had driven off this nightmare that had gripped Green Bank so tightly. Exhausted and injured, but incredibly alive, I watched as my fellow citizens cautiously surrounded me their fear slowly transforming into relief at having found our common enemy. As they helped me embrace my newfound gratitude for life, we realized that this ordeal was over, at least for now. Though we knew little about the monster which had plagued us all or where it may have retreated, we unanimously decided to join forces, using what limited knowledge and resources we possessed. The creature's victims— including my dear friend Sheldon, remained ever-present in our minds as we vowed to honor their memories by preparing for and facing any future horrors that might arise. Though time would eventually bring us answers surrounding this creature of nightmares, we would never forget the terror it wrought upon Green Bank or the strength and unity that rose out of such desperation. This happened to me one summer in a secluded region of Wyoming called Sinks Canyon. My name is Lyle Norquist, and I am an engineer by profession. I'd taken a temporary break from life to explore a more rural existence, inspired by my late uncle who'd always encouraged me to try new things. My best friend, Tegenmar, accompanied me, and our days were filled with fishing and hiking. The two of us often joked around, pondering the odds of the universe creating two people with such uncommon names who would forge a lifelong friendship. A few weeks into our stay, we noticed something strange, an abandoned truck at the edge of the woods with blood-smeared windows and what appeared to be claw marks on its side. We speculated that it could belong to one of the many missing persons reported in the news lately. As days went by, our conversations turned more serious. Calls for help rang through the canyon, but no cell service existed in this remote location. Even if we wanted to contact someone, it was just not possible out here. Tegan and I began discussing our own personal lives and backgrounds as we grew closer. The more time we spent together, the more wary we became of our surroundings. What had begun as a tranquil escape now felt eerie and uncertain. As the sun set one evening, we stumbled upon another gruesome crime scene, a mutilated body strewn across an isolated campsite. It wasn't long before we recognized the victim. It was Bill Grayson, an acquaintance from town whose name was just as rare as ours. We continued discovering ghastly scenes as though being taunted by some unknown force. We attempted to piece every detail together in order to make sense of these horrifying events that seemed too twisted for reality. One night, cautiously exploring deeper into the woods than before, we came face to face with an unnerving animalistic creature, hulking, feral, and covered in matted fur. It emitted a low growl that sent a shiver down my spine, causing both Tegan and me to freeze. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, and its mouth dripped with what appeared to be blood. 
We sensed that it was strange, menacing, but it seemed almost familiar. Tegan whispered to me, Could that thing be responsible for everything here? The missing people, the crime scenes, Bill? We stared at each other in disbelief that such a creature could exist and cause such havoc. We wanted to run but stayed rooted to the spot. As if sensing our fear, the creature lunged at us suddenly, revealing its sharp teeth and huge claws as it barked out a terrifying guttural screech. A desperate thought crossed my mind. I considered using my gun that I had brought along for protection against wildlife. But an inner voice told me that bullets would hardly affect this malicious being. It was too powerful for any conventional weaponry. As we tried our best to avoid provoking the beast further, it seemed uninterested in starting a conversation. Instead, it licked its lips hungrily as it stalked closer towards us. Tegan and I backed up slowly, pondering possible escape routes while exchanging nervous glances with each other. Tegan grabbed my arm, and without a word, we made a silent pact to try to outmaneuver the creature. The beast seemed to anticipate our every move, blocking our potential escape routes as we inched along the edge of the clearing. My hand shook as I grasped the unused gun, its presence in my hand both comforting and haunting. Suddenly, the creature dashed towards us, its muscular legs propelling it with incredible speed. In a split-second decision, I aimed the gun at the ground near the creature's paws and fired. The bullet struck dirt and rocks, sending debris flying into the air. The noise proved distracting enough to momentarily halt the beast's advance, providing us with just enough time to make a run for it. We sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us through the dark woods. Our breaths came in desperate gasps. Fear and adrenaline propelled us forward. I knew we needed help urgently, but we were miles away from any human settlement or cellular reception due to our remote location. As we stumbled over roots and branches in our frantic attempt to get away from the pursuing monster, I noticed a small cabin up ahead through the trees. We scrambled towards it without thinking. Anywhere seemed better than being out in the open with that thing chasing us. Once inside, we collapsed on the floor panting hysterically. Wasting no time, Tegan began searching for anything we could use to barricade ourselves in. Some heavy furniture, perhaps. All I found was an old-looking book on one of the dusty shelves a book which was too frail and ancient looking to be of any practical use. By pooling our limited resources together and pushing a heavy table against the door while stacking chairs on top of each other in front of windows, we managed to fortify ourselves inside as best as possible under such dire circumstances. The night dragged on at agonizingly slow pace. Every sound, every rustle, outside made us jump. At some point, we realized that we might be safer staying hidden in the cabin than trying to call for help. True, it might have eventually led to rescuers coming for us, but it could also alert the creature to our whereabouts. As dawn broke the following day, we knew we couldn't stay hidden inside any longer. As silently as possible, we unstacked the chairs and carefully moved the table away from the door. The woods greeted us with an eerie silence. Nothing stirred apart from the soft morning breeze rustling through leaves. Determined to get as far away from this place as we could, we set off towards our base camp, which was several miles away along a winding forest trail, praying that help could be found there. The entire journey was spent in constant terror of our pursuer. Every creaking tree branch or flutter of bird wings sent our hearts racing. Miraculously, though, we reached our base camp without any further encounters with the monstrous being that had haunted our nightmares. Never before had I felt so relieved in my life. Tears streamed down my face as I struggled for breath upon reaching the safety of familiar surroundings. That horrible creature remained a mystery to Tegan and me, 
its origins or purpose known only to itself should it have possessed the ability to ponder such things. All I could think of regarding its existence was that it might have been some sort of skinwalker or shapeshifter, a shape-changing entity not entirely unlike old legends warned against. One thing is certain, Bill and all those poor souls who went missing before us fell prey to something beyond human understanding. There are monsters in this world that prey on those who stumble into their territory, things never meant for human eyes to see nor human hearts to comprehend. Some secrets were simply meant to remain hidden within dark forests forever. I'll always carry those memories with me, the horrifying image of that feral creature, its seething presence in the shadows, and the loss of our dear friend. It's a nightmare I wish I could forget, but it's a stark reminder that there are some horrors in this world that cannot be easily explained or brushed aside. And sometimes, to survive such horrors, we must accept that life and the world around us are infinitely more complex and terrifying than we could have ever imagined. This happened to me long ago when I visited a remote location in West Virginia called Grafton, a place with vast forests and a sense of isolation perfect for my much-needed escape from city life. On that trip, I shared a cabin with my two closest friends, Augusta Pike and Calix Neville. As an elementary school teacher, I found solace in the serene surroundings. One evening, the three of us sat around the campfire discussing our lives. My students are really something, I said laughing. Little Timmy tried to trade lunch for an A on his test. As night fell, we heard rustling in the bushes and assumed it was a deer or a raccoon. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a gruesome sight, an entire campsite torn apart with belongings scattered everywhere. The scene looked like a bloody tornado had hit it. We should call for help, Augusta shakily suggested. Our phones don't have reception in this area, Calix reminded us. Fearful and disturbed, we decided to stay put. Believing we were safe by the fire, we took shifts on guard duty throughout the night. The next day, we crossed paths with strangers from another cabin who'd heard screams the previous night. We exchanged our experiences and ventured together to search for survivors. We split into groups. I chose to explore with Lysander Olson and Amara Stoddard. We walked in silence, alert and tense. Amara suddenly stopped and grabbed my arm as if she saw something terrifying. Her eyes fixated on something, deep claw marks on trees nearby. Analyzing the claw marks, they were too large for any animal present in West Virginia's forests. Lysander wondered if someone played a cruel joke or hoaxed us. We immediately rushed back to report our finding, but not before staring deeply into the clawed gashes one last time. Once reunited, we debated whether we had encountered an unknown predator or simply been victims of a prank. Our conversations were interrupted by the disappearance of Lysander and Amara. The remaining six of us quickly armed ourselves with hunting rifles and knives, forming a search party for our missing friends. Led by our mutual concern, we entered deeper into the forest despite dwindling sunlight. We soon found Lysander's lifeless body lying in a pool of blood, his wounds appearing as if caused by enormous talons. Gasping in horror, we realized that whatever did this was beyond our understanding and extremely dangerous. With courage fueled by desperation, we pressed on in search for Amara. Each step increasingly difficult as fear gripped our chests every snap twig or rustle in the bushes making us jumpy. A distant screaming cry echoed through the woods. Hurrying towards the sound, we discovered Amara's limp body hanging from a tree, showing similar grotesque wounds to Lysander's. Suppressing panic, 
I reminded everyone we couldn't unravel this nightmare by fleeing from it. I gathered the remaining members of our group and said, We need to find a way out of this forest as quickly and safely as possible. We can't do anything more for Lysander and Amara. There were murmurs of agreement, but we couldn't come up with a direct plan. We decided to split into three pairs for safety, with the instructions to shout or fire shots in case anything happened. I partnered up with Travis, and as we ventured to what we hoped was an exit from the dense forest, I started to question my decision not to call the authorities. It had initially felt like doing so would mean we had given up on our friends, but their lifeless bodies were hard evidence that we couldn't save them. The silence between us was suddenly broken when Travis gasped. Look! He pointed at footprints that led off the path. That print isn't human or any animal I've ever seen. He whispered. We followed the prints cautiously until they ended beneath a massive oak tree where we found more gashes, this time on the bark, hinting at a monstrous being's movement. There was no time to dwell on it. We heard gunshots echoing not far from us. Fear gripped us both as we sprinted towards the sound. When we got there, we found Nathan standing over Samuel's body, his eyes wide with terror. Samuel's legs were mauled savagely as if he had encountered an angry grizzly bear. What happened? I asked breathlessly. It. It came out of nowhere. Nathan stammered. It moved so fast I barely got a shot off. This thing is a nightmare. As Travis and Nathan continued talking about what had transpired, I reached for my phone and tried calling 911 but received no signal in these isolated woods. Realizing there was no easy solution and terrified for our lives, I quietly urged the group to keep moving. We quickly discovered Lisa and Haley's location after a short scream. Both were shaken but unharmed. After a quick discussion, the five of us decided our best chance for survival was to stick together and head straight through the woods. As Judy Collins' song, Send in the Clowns, drifted through my mind, the realization of the situation hit me. We had entered a forest that revealed not just unknown dangers but our greatest nightmares. I couldn't help but think that perhaps someone or something was using our fears against us. The creature we faced was unlike any known animal. Its footprints, strength, agility, and cunning hinted at a predatory shapeshifter previously relegated to folktales. But my knowledge of those tales was limited under normal circumstances let alone under duress and near darkness. We stumbled through the forest like a ragtag group of soldiers who had just lost a battle, survivors doing their best to escape with their lives intact. It felt like ages before we finally saw an opening and raced toward it, propelled by desperation rather than hope. Once free from the dire clutches of that nightmarish forest, we couldn't help but look back over our shoulders. No one escaped untouched by that monstrous creature. We sought refuge in a local diner and tried to make sense of our ordeal, each one of us attempting to remember or recount any folklore or stories they'd ever heard that might bear any resemblance to what we had encountered. But deep down inside, we all knew one undeniable fact. This war was far from over. With two lives already lost and three remaining completely altered by fear, we could only guess at what lay ahead. Our next logical step was to return home or call family members for help, anything but stay in close proximity to that terror-filled forest we had left behind. As much as we desperately yearned to understand what had occurred, no explanation or validation awaited us. So now... Driven by fear and a desire for self-preservation, we embark on a journey that will no doubt force us to face our fears. Whether it was folklore come to life or some unknown predator with a taste for human flesh, we were certain of one thing. We couldn't escape the nightmare in West Virginia's forests. 
We lost Lysander and Amara, but we won't let their deaths be in vain. Instead, their memory will drive us to understand the horror that hunted us down in those dark woods and fights so that others may remain safe from it. This happened to me a decade ago. My name is Wesley Fenton, and I used to live in Trout Creek, Montana, an off-the-grid hamlet. Life was simple, surrounded by dense forest and rugged mountains cape. One morning, Joanne Kellinger stopped by my cabin. We exchanged pleasantries before she mentioned her brother, Roland, had vanished into the woods the previous night. The unease in her eyes reflected the clouded sky overhead. Gathering a search group seemed essential. That's when my friend Vartan Moradian showed up with his hunting rifle. I glanced at it then back at him, and he said, Better safe than sorry. As we walked deeper into the woods, we noticed unusual scratches on tree trunks. They were different than anything we had seen before, long and thin with no identifiable pattern. That looks like it could be our missing guy commented Maricel Zagasti pointing at faint footprints near some bushes. We followed the trail further until Vartan suddenly stopped and gestured for us to crouch down. What's going on? Joan whispered with strained impatience. Vartan scanned the area in silence before gesturing to something behind a massive tree trunk. As we carefully approached, the stench of blood became overwhelming. There lay Roland's mauled body. Bite marks covered his lifeless frame. Eyes wide with terror mirrored our expressions perfectly. After notifying the authorities who investigated but found no leads on Roland's killer, we started taking precautions, rarely venturing out alone or without weapons. One day as I was jogging alongside a creek, something heavy struck me from behind. Crumpled on the ground, I tried to assess what had attacked me just as a strange creature lunged forward. It was quadrupedal with thick, matted fur covering its muscular body. However, it moved like no animal I'd ever seen. I scrambled backwards, barely dodging another lunge. The creature's massive claws punched the ground, narrowly missing my face. With a surge of adrenaline, I reached into my pocket and pulled out my hunting knife. It snarled viciously, bloodlust evident in its predatory gaze. As it charged again, I lunged, plunging the knife deep into its side. The creature howled in pain and retreated from its would-be meal. That night, we reinforced our homes while discussing the possibility of a local monster. Marisol proposed hiring a professional hunter to kill the creature. A week later, Stefan de Jonker arrived brandishing custom-made weapons and expertise garnered from a life of beast hunting. This specialist taught us to analyze the environment for signs of our quarry's whereabouts or movements, but wouldn't tell us its name. Saying a predator's name might just summon it, he warned cryptically. Meanwhile, our town endured ceaseless attacks some resulting in fatalities upon each violent encounter with the monster. Patience wore thin as accusations flew among our small community. Finally, Stefan tracked the elusive assailant to its lair on Mount Baldy's remote northern slope. We cautiously proceeded toward the mouth of a cave where faint growls echoed within. With the sound of growls echoing from the cave, our group of townspeople, led by Stefan, proceeded cautiously. Nobody dared to call for help, fearing that attracting more attention would only increase the death toll and awaken more monsters. Upon entering the cave, we were met by a gut-churning stench. Against one wall lay a pile of bones and carcasses half-devoured, evidence of our monstrous intruder's insatiable appetite. Stefan gave us a signal to move forward, and each footfall echoed as we delved into the darkness. Suddenly, 
we heard heavy breathing emanating from behind a large rock. Our hearts pounded, but we knew there was no time to hesitate. Before any of us could react, the creature pounced on Marisol, its gnashing teeth ripping her throat apart. Blood sprayed as she gurgled out screams for help that went unanswered. We watched in horror and disbelief as our dear friend perished before us. Driven by rage and fear, Stefan fired his custom-made weapon at the beast while it was distracted with its meal. The onslaught forced it to retreat further into the cave but did not slow it down completely. The situation became a desperate chase. Fearful of leaving the creature alive and free to attack again, Stefan led us deeper into its lair determined to end this nightmare once and for all. As we continued our pursuit, another member of our group would be wounded, clawed from behind as they scrambled away from the beast that would not be deterred. Despite the relentless struggle between human and beast, we pushed on without calling for outside aid, thinking that shedding attention on our town's plight would prevent others from coming to harm. Finally cornered after one final encounter in which Stefan valiantly thrust his spear into its arm in an attempt to take it down, the creature stood before us unable to flee any farther. Its battered form stared at us with hatred in its eyes, blood dripping from its various wounds onto the cavern floor. Its true form still unclear to even Stefan, the monstrous beast seemed to be on the verge of shifting or transforming. With a mighty roar, it leaped at us one last time. Stefan aimed and fired his custom-made weapon right into its heart. The creature let out a deafening screech as it fell, twitching and writhing in pain before finally going still. We cautiously approached the now lifeless body of the animal that terrorized our village for so long. Its true nature was still unclear. It was neither a known animal nor an inexplicable paranormal being. But whatever it was, it had been defeated. The group silently discussed our next steps. It would not serve any benefit to release news of a parasitic creature roaming their town, killing and terrorizing its innocent inhabitants without hesitation. So we made a pact, a somber agreement, to never speak of our experiences again that took Marisol's life along with countless others. With heavy hearts, we returned home knowing the danger that lurked in our very own countryside had subsided, but wary of unknown monsters that could be around any corner. Due to lack of concrete knowledge about this creature's origin or true identity, all we were left with were assumptions of skinwalkers or shapeshifters. Reality shifted in ways that couldn't have been fathomed before our encounter on Mount Baldy. We learned there are terrors beyond what can be easily understood or explained. Our experience brought terror we had never felt before. However, it also formed bonds amongst us strengthened in ways no other life event could ever replicate. Months later, while healing from the wounds inscribed by vicious claws and contemplating the sanity within our day-to-day -day existence, skins of both human and beast, we carry memories of all those lost to this creature hidden away deep within, buried reluctantly under a layer of grief, perseverance, and survival. This happened to me a while back, at Bear Brook State Park in New Hampshire. I'm John Wilkins, an outdoors type who loves exploring off-grid locations. One day, I was chatting with my best friend Justin Ambrose about this new hiking trail we wanted to explore. Normally, we'd trek less dangerous paths, but the adrenaline rush convinced us. Justin nonchalantly joked about going for a hike that might end with us being rescued by helicopters. Our journey into the woods started uneventfully. As we walked, the scenery around us transformed into a dense forest that seemed to swallow sound itself. It was easy to miss mid-conversations as the thick foliage almost overwhelmed our senses. Eventually, 
We stumbled upon an abandoned campsite, unexpectedly gruesome, scattered belongings, blood-soaked clothes, and no sign of survival. We exchanged silent apprehensions but hesitated to call search and rescue without proper proof of danger. As we pushed forward through the eerie landscape, our skepticism remained tantamount. But soon enough, laughter echoed amongst us again as Justin cracked vibrant puns about how we were. Trailblazing. Late afternoon came and we found a suitable place to set up camp for the night near a little stream nestled between towering trees. As the sun dipped beneath the horizon, an undisturbed silence settled over our surroundings. We feasted on canned beans and shared stories about our childhoods until it was time for bed. Sometime in the deep dark hours of the night, ungodly screams tore through our peaceful sleep. Sitting bolt upright and heart pounding, I instantly reached for my flashlight. Justin muttered something under his breath before turning on his own light source. As we scanned our surroundings for any signs of life or danger, my initial thoughts raced to memories of Russell-filled documentaries showcasing savage bear attacks and fierce predators. Eventually deciding it was too risky to venture out in search of whatever could make such an inhuman sound, we chose to remain in the tent armed with our hunting knives. Morning light arrived cautiously, and we reluctantly prepared ourselves for the hike back. Our light hearts now weighed down by dread and unease we never experienced such gut-wrenching fear in those woods. Hours later, we reminisced about simpler times when our biggest worry was which brand of chips Justin preferred. Soon even that couldn't lift the sinister atmosphere that had now settled upon us. As the sun began to set on our second day in the forest, a rustling beyond the bushes brought our fatigued nerves to focus. Following an excruciating silence, a grotesque figure emerged from the shadows, at once human but hideously deformed. Claw-like appendages hung from its elongated arms as twisted legs allowed it to stalk gracefully towards us, saliva dripping from its bared teeth. Backing away slowly, terror coursed through my veins. It occurred to me at that exact moment just how improbable it would be for anyone to hear us if we screamed for help out here. The scent of blood hung in the air as realization struck. This creature was responsible for what had transpired at that abandoned campsite. Panic rising, we sprinted through a ragged labyrinth of old trees while what seemed to be a monstrous hybrid rapidly gained on us. Sweat stung my eyes. Adrenaline propelled us onwards as shrill laughter rippled through the dense forest foliage, punctuating each guttural cry from its endless pursuit. And there it was behind me without warning, leaping off a high boulder aiming straight for me midair. I could see the glinting sunlight reflecting off its razor-sharp claws. Time seemed to slow down as the creature raced toward me. Its elongated arms reached out, ready to rip me apart. My heart pounded as all I could think about was running, getting as far away as possible. Justin! I shouted, hoping my friend had heard me. If anyone could help me, it was him. But we had become separated in the chaos of our desperate escape. The creature's twisted legs propelled it forwards with unimaginable speed, closing the distance between us. I ran, my breath ragged and my vision blurred. Suddenly, something solid slammed into the creature from the side, forcing it down onto the forest floor. That something turned out to be Justin, who tackled the creature and wrestled it away from me. Run! he yelled, but I hesitated momentarily, amazed by his courage. Stumbling over tree roots and dodging branches in our frantic escape, we eventually found ourselves facing a jagged cliff. With nowhere else to run and the sound of the creature growing closer, Justin began to claw desperately at the dirt and rocks that made up the cliff face. Up! We need to climb! he said urgently. My heart dropped. Climbing was never my strong suit. 
but with no other option left, I tackled the cliff alongside Justin. Miraculously, we managed to scale most of the cliff face before hearing the vicious snarl of the creature below. As far as we could tell from our precarious position of safety on a narrow rocky ledge, much too treacherous for even that monstrosity, it seemed unable or unwilling to follow us up. With only a few days' worth of hiking separating us from civilization now looming directly below us in this brutal and unforgiving environment teeming with unknown dangers such as this malignant force stalking our every move we realized long since forgotten were thoughts concerning frivolous matters like Justin's preferred flavor of chips. Only daily survival mattered at this point. As darkness fell, we huddled together on the ledge, silently weighing our options. We couldn't stay there indefinitely, but for now, it seemed safer than facing the nightmare waiting below. A thought crossed my mind. Had this creature pursued others like us? Was this what happened to the hikers from that abandoned campsite? Looking down into the darkness where it lay hidden and ever watching— I began to wonder if we could ever hope of outwitting such a cunning adversary. For three days and nights we clung to that ledge while Justin made forays each morning in search of a way to escape this death trap we found ourselves in. On the fourth day, entirely by accident, Justin discovered a narrow crevasse cutting through part of the mountain. With no other option in sight— we gathered our courage and squeezed ourselves into the tight space just as daylight began to fade and shadows grew long around us once more. We crawled in silence through complete darkness and narrow spaces, barely wide enough for our bodies. Justin led with me following close behind when suddenly, he froze as if sensing something was wrong up ahead. I strained my ears— catching only faint whispers that chilled me to the bone, wordless calls from far away that sent an involuntary shiver coursing through my being. Was it the creature waiting once more at the end of this treacherous passage for our battered remnants, hoping despair would eventually lead us onto its waiting claws? There's an opening up ahead. Justin whispered cautiously as we now moved forward ever so slowly with renewed trepidation until finally emerging from within confines of that cloying claustrophobic chasm onto relative safety, or so we hoped. Despite all odds, we made it back to civilization. Though police questioned us extensively about our ordeal and what happened during those four harrowing days spent alone out there with that thing— we kept our experiences to ourselves, mainly for fear of being labeled insane and locked away in some cold, sterile institution. But deep down I can't help but wonder was that creature, with its twisted legs and elongated arms, a skinwalker or shapeshifter of dark origins? Though I may never know the answers to my questions or if it still lives stalking some other hapless traveler lost deep within shadows of that accursed wilderness I am forever haunted by these unsettling thoughts even now when at last safe behind locked doors silent night comes creeping ever closer like raven black wings stretched wide to envelop all within its chilling embrace. This happened to me a decade ago in the dense wilderness of Idaho at an off-the-grid campsite, where I went alone to escape the hustle of city life. My name is Orville Drexler, and I recently got divorced. My plan was to stay here for some time and let nature heal me. The first person I encountered there was Agnieszka Pierce, an unusual woman who lived close by in a wooden cabin that resembled a tool shed. She shared with me stories of local legends while munching on wild berries. One day, as we walked together examining animal tracks near the creek, she seemed uneasy. She began to recount whispers of a terrifying creature that lurked in these woods, though she had never seen it herself. People often went missing, she confided in me. Had I not been so skeptical, I might have noticed the red flag sooner. I continued enjoying my peaceful days, 
only occasionally finding temporary unease when my memory recalled the ominous words shared by Agnieszka. That was until the fateful night when I was startled awake by a gut-wrenching scream carrying through the trees. Yet, at that moment, no one else seemed nearby to be asking for help. Still groggy from sleep, I brushed it off as just a figment of my imagination. The very next morning, Agnieszka stopped by my campsite looking pale and troubled. She revealed that a person had gone missing from a nearby camp the night before. Disbelief washed over me as reality aligned eerily with her tales. Despite this synchronicity, deep down I remained reluctant to believe in anything supernatural or otherworldly. Days later, we hiked deep into the forest guided only by our curiosity until we stumbled across an abandoned hunting shack. Curiosity led us inside where we found various weapons like rifles and knives scattered chaotically throughout the room. The thick layer of dust suggested that no one had been there for years. Close to twilight, we reached the edge of a ravine. A strong stench filled the air, making our stomachs turn. This vile scent accompanied the shocking sight before us, a mangled body left behind as if it was a mere toy cast aside by a bored child. It was then that we discovered the grim reality. Someone or something was brutally killing people in these woods. Not knowing what to do, we stumbled back towards the campsite with heavy hearts while the night thickened around us. Our sense of safety evaporated as we realized that we were potentially sharing this space with a bloodthirsty beast. After our gruesome find, fearful conversations populated the campfire nights. People murmured of seeing a shadowy figure leaping through the trees on all fours at remarkable speeds. Its elongated limbs appeared out of place on its muscular body and gleaming rows of sharp teeth glinted ominously within its elongated, grotesque snout. This creature didn't utter even a single word as if intentionally depriving us of verifiable information. One by one, more people disappeared from our once vibrant community until only Agnieszka and I remained. Desperation drove us to make a plan so dangerous that it should have been unthinkable. We decided to confront this beast ourselves. Armed with rifles from the abandoned shack, we set off into the darkness of what would ultimately be our last evening on this suffocating earth. As we wandered through unfamiliar territory, Agnieszka suddenly tripped over something large in her path and fell forward onto her knees. My heart sank into my stomach when I pulled out my flashlight and saw what had befallen her. Another careless footstep would have taken us directly into the gaping ribcage of another lost soul among these trees. The discovery made it painfully clear that whatever hunted us was still nearby, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. With a renewed sense of urgency, Agnieszka and I continued venturing deeper into the unknown, rifles at the ready. Our only goal was to eliminate this threat, whatever it might be. We could not call for help. The others were already gone, and there was no one left to save us. We walked cautiously, listening for any signs of movement or danger. In the distance, we could hear a faint rustling beyond the dense foliage. As we came closer to the sound, we saw an enormous creature looming in front of us. Its leathery skin stretched taut over rippling muscles as it prowled on all fours through the forest floor. Its grotesque snout twitched, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth that gleamed beneath the moonlight. Hands shaking, I called out to Agnieszka just as she aimed her rifle at it, waiting for an opportune moment to strike. Moments before she could pull the trigger, the creature charged. It mauled her with terrifying speed, leaving her body broken and lifeless on the forest floor. Frozen with shock and grief for my departed friend, I tried my best to steady my hands as I aimed my rifle at the beast once more. It snarled menacingly and lunged towards me, enraged by our presence in its territory. 
I fired a single shot with my trembling hands just as it tackled me to the ground. To my disbelief and relief, it convulsed in pain before slumping lifelessly onto me. The final bullet had struck a vital organ or artery sending it into its sudden death. With great effort, I managed to push the now motionless body off myself before looking around, trying to find some semblance of safety or sanity in this terrible place. I wanted nothing more but to leave these accursed woods immediately. Agnieszka. She didn't deserve this fate. None of you as did but there was nothing else I could do but carry on with my life, knowing that whatever this creature was may cease to terrorize others because of our actions tonight. A few days later, safely away from the woods in a small motel, I researched what the creature could have been. I didn't believe in folklore or mythical creatures, but the horrors we faced were far from a simple animal attack. Eventually, I stumbled upon a detailed article about skinwalkers and shapeshifters in obscure cultures. Could such a creature really exist? Could it have been the cause behind all the disappearances and gruesome deaths in our former community? All rational thought told me it was a nightmarish fantasy at best, yet deep down in me, something pushed my belief towards these harrowing legends. This newfound knowledge filled me with dread and unwilling fascination. I made the choice to never return to those woods. The memories of my lost friends, especially Agnieszka's sacrifice, would remain unforgotten as long as I lived. My heart heavy with sorrow, grief, and fear, I decided to move far away from the area where we once resided. Starting anew elsewhere seemed like the only viable option for me to move forward with my life. While I could never be entirely sure about what we had encountered that night, or why it chose to prey on us specifically, one thing was clear. Some truths are too terrifying and dangerous to seek out or comprehend. In an attempt to honor Agnieszka and all those who lost their lives to this monstrous adversary, I committed myself to giving back where I could. Volunteering in various charities and working towards making communities safer brought me solace in leaving behind that which almost took my life as well. As time passed by and my disdain for morbid curiosities faded with age, an undying hope grew within me, a hope that no one else would ever experience the cruel malevolence of the nightmare that I could only assume was a skinwalker or shapeshifter. It was our unwitting bravery that stopped the mysterious beast, but it was my determination to make a difference that would prevent anything like this from plaguing us again. This happened to me a few weeks ago, working at a remote cabin in Yukon River Valley, Alaska. My name is Lennox Gorin, and I befriended one of the local hunters, Celso Tarquin. We had settled into our evening routine, discussing life and laughter over a bottle of whiskey. There was a growing unease among the locals due to unsolved missing persons cases in recent weeks. The whole atmosphere changed when we received a disturbing phone call from Celso's father. His hysterical voice recounted a horrific scene of his wife brutally attacked. Panicking, Celso and I rushed to their house. As we entered, we found his father crying in the corner, his face marred by fear. The living room was covered in blood, chunks of flesh strewn across the floor. His mother lay grotesquely mutilated on the couch, her body torn apart beyond recognition. Celso called emergency services as I dialed the police. Both were put on hold due to high call volumes that night. We borrowed guns from his father's cabinet and began a search for the attacker or any indication about what may have caused this gruesome crime. Hours passed without answers. Our weary footfalls accompanied only by distant howling wind, as if warning us away from untold horrors lurking ahead. Finally, something broke our search, 
movement in the trees nearby. A quick glimpse revealed large dark shapes shifting through branches with unnatural speed and agility. Terrified, we aimed our weapons at the monstrous figure towering before us, its skin a sickly shade of gray-green and unnervingly smooth, elongated limbs covered in subtle ridges and bony protrusions. Its eyes displayed intelligent but malevolent intent, and around its maw clung tendrils of sinew, as if trailing hungrily behind an endlessly open mouth craving more sustenance. Our instinct screamed desperately for escape, yet curiosity held our frozen fingers to the trigger lock. We both fired shots at the creature, but it seemed unfazed, dodging with uncanny agility. We stumbled upon the realization that there was more than one of them when we cornered by multiple creatures blocking every exit possible. Outnumbered and terrified, we somehow managed to escape their grasp and sprint back to his father's house, spurred by adrenaline and a foreign fear that overwhelmed us completely. The police eventually arrived, investigating both with concern and disbelief. The station received several similar reports that night, attacks so violent yet utterly inconsistent with the work of any known predators in the region. Our story was dismissed as an exaggeration born from disoriented panic. But for weeks afterwards, Celso and I haunted by sleepless nights, tortured by ceaseless questions spiraling into madness, what were those creatures? Why were they plaguing this quiet part of Alaska? How many more lives would be lost? Slowly, as if lured into oblivion by our inability to find closure, our regular conversations turned toward revenge. Enough was enough. No one else should suffer like we had or witness such horror again. The two of us hatched an ill-conceived plan, determined more than ever, doomed, to face these creatures head-on, even if it meant losing everything we held dear in the process. As we searched for our elusive prey, we collected evidence lending credibility to our story, bent trees, shredded clothing, mangled gore. Each day blurred indistinguishably into another without progress, nor respite from the nightmares clawing at the edges of our sanity. Lennox and Celso spent months stalking these mysterious beings all over Alaska, finding abandoned cabins ripped apart as if flayed apart by a vicious hurricane, butchered livestock drained entirely of blood, silent crying witnesses hidden in plain sight under bleak skies scorched crimson by fits of pain and anguish that refused to fade away. Tired, bruised, and bleeding, Celso and I continued our pursuit. We had become obsessed, consumed by the goal to end this terror that loomed over our town. Our days were filled with futile searches, while our nights were haunted by demonic nightmares. Inexplicably drawn to the location where we had encountered them, we retraced our steps in the hope of stumbling upon a clue. One fateful night, as rain pelted down and nature added a sense of impending doom to our already dark surroundings, we stumbled upon an unlikely ally. As we trudged through a thick forested area near a creek, we encountered another survivor, a bear hunter who also sought to end the reign of terror these creatures had unleashed. Without hesitation, he shared his story. The beast attacked him during one of his hunting trips, leaving him with scars no hunter should bear. We found his descriptions eerily similar to those anomalous creatures stalking our nightmares. They smelled like rotting flesh and earth but moved with unnatural speed. Together with the hunter, we formed an uneasy alliance, three beings united against an unknown foe that tormented us relentlessly. We decided to search for these beasts together. The task felt lighter with companions who understood each other's pain. Days turned into weeks as we pursued them through rugged landscapes shaped by merciless weather. We trailed their every footstep. Desperate calls for help echoed in vain through seemingly endless wilderness. Then, finally, in a starless Alaskan night draped in foreboding darkness, we stumbled upon them again. 
their faces twisted with rage and bloodlust, they fixated on me, surging forward as if propelled by palpable hatred. It was at this moment when I realized that instead of hunting these creatures down, it was they who led us on a wild goose chase, right into their lair. Pure instinct took over as I raised my firearm, shouting to Celso and the hunter to stand back while simultaneously firing. The shot hit the creature's shoulder, but my action only served to enrage it further. Incredible speed and gore met my eyes as the beast charged, knocking me to my knees and shattering bones within. The fatal mistake had just been committed. They now knew what weapons we possessed. The creature's eyes bore into Alma and the hunter, their attention momentarily swayed from me. In one swift motion, they pounced on my companions and tore their bodies apart with gleeful abandonment leaving behind a massacre of viscera. With aching bones broken by the sheer force of this unknown enemy I scuffled through muck and glass, ignoring the pain with each hurried movement. My lungs burned for air as I willed through obstacles. Exhausted, I stumbled upon a crude road nearby. Although I had escaped death, my heart weighed heavy with sorrow at leaving Celso's mangled body behind. A single thought reverberated in my mind. Why didn't we call for help? Finally safe from their grasp but lost in desolation near rising daylight's edge, I sought shelter. Help arrived soon enough as some passing hunters happened upon a disheveled me and spirited me away from this accursed place. As I recuperate under their care, I look back at their twisted faces haunting memories just past their dark orbs fixated on Alma moments before her demise. They were no ordinary creatures. It was evident in their unnatural agility and cruelty that struck terror in even our most primal instincts. My assumption remains accurate. Indeed, these beings were more than mere beasts but shapeshifters or perhaps skinwalkers summoned from folklore's darkest pages. Facing such grotesque villains' incomprehensible existence threatens what little sanity remains in me as sleepless nights continue to plague my once steady mind. The massacre forever seared onto my retina serves as a chilling reminder on why some mysteries are better left unsolved. This happened to me not too long ago. I had rented a cabin in the dense wilderness of Yellowstone Park, hoping for some solitude and relaxation. My name is Ruben Kozlowski, a tired accountant from a bustling city. Upon arrival, the cabin seemed perfect, rustic, secluded, and surrounded by heavy woods. The only neighbor was an old man named Cornelius Vanstone who lived a short walk down the dirt path. We spoke briefly. He mentioned the quiet life and how it suited him. One evening, as I chopped firewood outside, I noticed something odd, a painfully shrill scream echoing through the forest. Knowing there were animals in these woods, I dismissed it as their howling. As days passed, I became friends with Cornelius. He was a retired biologist who spent his days studying local flora and fauna. He had once been married but lost his wife to an aggressive illness several years ago. During one of our conversations in his small kitchen, I recounted the chilling screams I heard nights before. Cornelius frowned and told me about a creature he'd been researching an animalistic predator unlike anything he'd ever seen. He didn't know its name or what it truly was. However, he knew something wasn't right with this beast. Sometime later, as we were walking in the woods together, we discovered a chilling scene, mangled remains of what used to be a hiker. It looked like something tore him apart limb by limb with razor-sharp talons or teeth. We called the park rangers to investigate but found they were puzzled too. They insisted on alerting the authorities and advised we keep our distance from any unusual activity. 
My nights grew restless with this newfound knowledge and unknown killer hiding in these once tranquil woods. One evening, while resting on my porch after another day of unsuccessfully exploring those sinister woods with Cornelius, I heard rustling nearby. My heart raced as a figure emerged from the shadows. A moment's relief washed over me when I saw it was my friend. Instead of his usual love of exploration, though, he wobbled and stumbled toward me. Blood covered his clothes and face, drenching his beard deep red. Reuben, help! He gasped before collapsing. Quickly, I called an ambulance and explained we were in a remote part of Yellowstone. They assured me they'd arrive as soon as possible. Over the course of a few tense hours, I'd learned what happened to Cornelius. He'd discovered more torn-apart human remains while hiking that day. However, this time the creature spotted him too. It towered over him, easily standing more than nine feet tall. The monster had huge claws, rows of sharp teeth, and massive antlers atop its terrifying form. It wasn't paranormal but indeed a creature that nature had cruelly birthed. Fumbling in confusion and fear, Cornelius was fortunate to escape with his life, but severely injured in the process. As we awaited the ambulance, I grasped an old shotgun Cornelius kept tucked under his bed. Shadows played tricks on us in that dark forest night, making eerie forms. The thought of facing this gruesome creature clawed through my chest always made my heart race increasingly every second. Prepared for the worst yet still shaken at the prospect of encountering this beast, I whispered to my friend who was lying semi-conscious inside, Cornelius, you'll be fine. Huddled with Cornelius and holding the shotgun, I kept a watchful eye on the forest. The monster that Cornelius described could make its appearance any time. The creature seemed to resemble what people call skinwalkers, but I didn't believe in such folklore. It had to be a real creature, one that was undiscovered and dangerous. The distant sound of sirens signaled the ambulance's arrival. Two paramedics jumped out and hurried towards us. They asked us questions about the wounds as they treated Cornelius. In between shallow breaths, he described the creature. The head paramedic's eyes widened, exchanging glances with her colleague. They gently loaded Cornelius onto a stretcher before wheeling him to the ambulance. As I collected our belongings from the cabin, a gust of wind swirled around me, ruffling the leaves nearby. The sensation made my hair stand on end. It was like being watched. As we rumbled along towards the hospital, I clutched onto Cornelius' hand for comfort. Sitting next to me in his soiled clothes, he looked weak and pale. On reaching the hospital, doctors wheeled Cornelius into surgery while I waited anxiously in the waiting room. A local police officer approached asking for details about what happened in Yellowstone. I recounted our encounter with the horrifying creature that attacked Cornelius. The officer listened intently before asking more questions regarding its physical appearance and if I'd seen anything similar recently. He jotted down my answers in his notepad and excused himself from our conversation. Hours later, Cornelius' surgery was over and he was resting in a hospital bed with tubes running in and out of his body. I resolved to visit him as frequently as possible during his recovery. Friends called regularly to ask how he was doing, their concern apparent despite their lack of knowledge about the creature responsible for his injuries. Days later, Cornelius seemed to have gained some strength. His voice was more audible when he spoke, albeit weakly. We talked about what happened and forced smiles onto our faces as we reminisced about better times. As I left the hospital one evening, the police officer who had interviewed me earlier approached with a somber expression. The remains your friend found in Yellowstone were identified as hikers who went missing a few months ago, he said quietly. 
he continued to inform me that the area where Cornelius encountered the creature would be cordoned off until further notice. I thanked the officer sincerely and proceeded to find my way home. Over the next few weeks, Cornelius grew stronger, and soon enough, he was released from the hospital, albeit with scars that would stay with him forever. We'd seen firsthand the brutality that nature could inflict upon unsuspecting victims. The deaths of those hikers would remain engraved in our minds for years to come, victims to an unknown creature that still roamed Yellowstone's forests. As I moved on with my life, I couldn't help but wonder if we'd ever have an explanation for what we'd seen. More importantly, if such a creature existed, how many others might be lurking in the forests? While pondering over these questions, I came to realize that there are corners of this earth where logic is yet to tread and mysteries are destined to remain unsolved. The possibility of encountering more horrifying creatures was always present. All we can do is be vigilant and live our lives one day at a time. In the end, perhaps life doesn't need answers or explanations for every occurrence. Sometimes we must accept things as they are and learn to live in harmony, or at least in mutual avoidance, with the secrets of nature. This happened to me about a decade ago when I was visiting the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. I had recently lost my job and decided to take some time to regroup by immersing myself in nature. My name is Elias Bertrand, an engineer by trade, but an outdoorsman at heart. The first day, I set up camp near the Kinsua Creek and met a fellow camper named Lyle McHale. He told me he'd been coming here for years and had never encountered anything out of the ordinary. The forest had a soothing effect on us, with its gentle rustling leaves and chirping birds. One morning, as we were eating breakfast, we noticed a foul odor in the air. It smelled like something rotting nearby, disturbingly disgusting. We decided to investigate the source of the stench cautiously making our way through the dense foliage. As we moved deeper into the woods, the smell intensified. When we finally stumbled upon its source, what we found left us both speechless and horrified. A man's body, or what remained of it, lay sprawled between two trees. His limbs were mangled and torn apart like he'd been attacked by a wild animal. We exchanged uneasy glances before stepping back, both trying hard not to gag at the sight. Lau pulled out his cell phone to call for help but realized he had no signal, typical for such a remote location. We need to get back to camp and find a landline, he insisted. As we rushed through the woods toward safety, we couldn't shake off an eerie feeling that someone or something was watching us. That sensation seemed irrational until we heard leaves rustling behind us. What was that? Lyle exclaimed while we stopped in our tracks. Probably just a deer. I reassured him with little conviction in my voice. When we reached our campsite, we were relieved to see a ranger patrolling nearby. We quickly recounted our gruesome discovery and asked for her help. Still trembling from the experience, we urged her to act immediately. As we led the ranger to where we found the body, that sense of being watched resurfaced. I thought back to Lyle mentioning a predator called the Allegheny Devil that locals spoke of in hushed tones, only half believing such myths could be true. Arriving at the scene, I realized that familiar smell was now more overpowering than before. The body remained in its grisly state, but there was an additional layer of unease as if something had returned to check on its kill. The ranger, a seasoned professional named Mara Tennant, surveyed the area and took several photos. She informed us it was likely a bear attack, but I couldn't ignore the nagging feeling that this wasn't just any animal assault. 
As darkness closed in around us, my imagination stirred with terrible thoughts. Lao could tell I was distressed and turned to me saying, Elias, don't dwell on it too much. These things happen in nature. Let's head back to camp. That night sleep eluded me as I lay rigid in my tent, every rustling leaf and twig snap causing fear to surge through me. A guttural growl echoed outside my tent, drawing closer with menacing intent. My heart raced as something brushed against the canvas of my shelter. Suddenly, a scream tore through the darkness. It was Lyle's voice. I unzipped my tent and stumbled outside, fingers trembling as they gripped around my knife handle. An unseen force dragged him through the foliage, struggling against whatever had ensnared him. Mara sprinted past me with her rifle raised about to take aim when Lyle's terrified cries stopped abruptly. The forest fell into a chilling silence as we searched for our friend with heightened urgency, realizing that time was running out. I can't see him anywhere, Mara whispered with despair, her usual confidence wavering. As the moon cast eerie shadows through the trees, we caught sight of those same two trees where we'd found the dead man earlier. My stomach clenched as Lyle dangled from a branch, his body mangled like the victim from before. I scrambled over to him, feverishly cutting at the rope that bound him. Helpless despair washed over me when it became clear he was already gone, despite my frantic efforts to free him. Panic tears filled my eyes. My legs felt heavy and trembled with fear as I backed away from Lao's corpse. The reality of our situation hit me like a ton of bricks. We were being hunted. Mara's trembling voice broke through my thoughts. We need to get help. I nodded, unable to form words. We picked up our supplies and sped through the dark forest, praying we'd stumble upon civilization or at least someone who could help us. As we walked hastily, something felt off. The air around us seemed to thicken and weigh down on us. My chest tightened with an unshakable sense of being watched. We didn't dare call out, knowing that drawing attention to ourselves would only put us at greater risk of being found by whatever had killed Lyle. In the darkness, we stumbled upon a small road. I pulled out my phone, praying that I had service but when I saw that there was no reception, frustration and hopelessness washed over me. The sensation of being watched grew stronger as the night dragged on. When we weren't moving, it felt like something was just beyond the reach of our flashlight beams, lingering in the shadows as malicious intent radiated from it. Mara spotted a house just off the road and suggested we run up to it hoping against hope that its occupants would be able to help us or at the very least offer shelter from whatever pursued us. But when we approached the doorstep and frantically knocked on the door, no one answered. Desperate, we circled the house, peering through windows for any sign of life. Empty. We forced open a window and climbed inside. The floor creaked under our feet as we sought refuge within the abandoned house. We shut ourselves in a room and sat together. One flashlight pointed at the door while Mara gripped her rifle tightly across her lap. We sat in silence, listening for sounds of movement, any sign that the creature had followed. And then, in an instant, we heard clawing on the exterior of the house, scratching and tearing at the walls. The thing was searching for us. Instinctively, I buried my face in Mara's shoulder, trying to muffle my sobs. The chilling reality of our situation seeped into every fiber of my being. As the clawing and scratching intensified, our hearts raced. It felt like the culmination of our terror would erupt into madness when suddenly, everything stopped. We dared not move. For hours, neither one of us dared to breathe too loudly fearing the creature would return. When light began to filter through the dusty windows, we knew we couldn't stay there any longer. Stealing ourselves for potential conflict, 
We opened the door slowly and peered outside. But there was nothing, no trace of whatever had pursued us throughout the night. Mara and I made our way through the woods, looking for any sign of nearby civilization or help. Our fear fueled us as we wandered through the thick forest, torn clothes snagging on branches with each passing step. Finally, after what felt like days of wandering through endless wilderness, we stumbled upon a small cabin inhabited by an older couple. They took us in without question, providing food and care that left us incredibly grateful. I shuddered to think about what would have happened if we hadn't found help when we did. The memory of those events will haunt me forever, but at least I have someone to share that burden with. Mara and I forged a bond stronger than steel that night, united by our harrowing experience with a creature neither one of us can truly identify. Our assumption is that it was something akin to a shapeshifter or skinwalker but ultimately can't be sure. All we know is that it hunts with terrifying ferocity and claimed the life of one of the best people I ever knew. Since that night, I've done my best to move on from the horrific events we endured, clinging to the normalcy of life as a life preserver. But I will always cherish the memory of Lyle, for no matter how much time passes, he can never be replaced. This happened to me quite some time ago. I was headed to a secluded cabin in the Appalachian Mountains with my co-workers, Lana Klein and Derek Upshaw. We had planned a small retreat to brainstorm new marketing strategies away from the distractions of our bustling office. Upon reaching the cabin, we wasted no time setting up our workstations near the roaring fireplace. As daytime turned to dusk, we began recounting stories about our lives outside of work. I shared my humble upbringing in a rural farm town, and how it led me to be resourceful with the limited resources available to me. Lana received a distressing phone call from her sister. Apparently, her nephew had been found dead nearby, his body brutally mauled as if an animal attacked him. However, no one could determine what kind of beast had inflicted such devastation. Lana's grief quickly faded into determination as she insisted on investigating her nephew's dreadful death. Not wanting her to face this challenge alone, Derek and I decided to join her in search for clues in the surrounding woods. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, we came across other victims, hikers, campers, even woodland creatures exhibiting similar gruesome injuries as Lana's nephew. The pattern of these disturbing events was perplexing, but one thing became clear. The culprit seemed animalistic yet highly methodical, displaying an unnatural aptitude for hunting its prey. During our exploration, we discovered a deserted mining town known as Cahaba Bend. It appeared untouched for decades, eerily abandoned but preserved like a twisted time capsule. The locals had previously mentioned that unusual incidents in this area began generations ago. Now we were witnessing a horrifying continuation of decimation. Suddenly, we heard rustling noises nearby and caught sight of a peculiar creature lurking amongst the shadows. This monster was unlike any known wildlife it towered over us with muscular limbs covered in rough black scales vicious claws on its hands and feet accompanied with powerful jaws lined with razor-sharp teeth. It's unclear what triggered the beast's attention, but it began pursuing us relentlessly. We ran as fast as we could and managed to elude it temporarily, superfluously concealing our weapon-stocked backpack in a dilapidated storage shed on the outskirts of town. Later, Derek asked why no one called for help. To our dismay, our phones had no signal in this remote landscape. The creature's growls echoed through the haunted streets of Cahaba Bend while we discussed our options. I think it's attracted to the scent of blood, Lana proposed as I tended to a deep cut on her arm. 
Derek agreed, commenting on how efficiently it culled both weak and robust victims alike. Our adrenaline-fueled survival instincts kicked in as we devised a plan to retrace our steps and retrieve our hidden weaponry using my extensive knowledge of off-the-grid navigation techniques. With nothing but sheer wit and determination guiding us, we knew that grasping onto our time-tested skills was essential in order to confront the brutal antagonism lurking within this forsaken land. But before that, I tried lightening the mood with a jest about secretly always wanting to test my survival skills on reality television. However, these present circumstances were far beyond anything I'd ever envisioned. Tickled by awkward laughter amidst adrenaline-fueled fear, we resumed our mission. As darkness enveloped us completely, we gradually made our way back to the shed where we stashed our belongings. Moonlight filtered through the thick canopy above, casting eerie silhouettes and intensifying every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves beneath our feet. Our hearts pounded relentlessly, each beat weighing heavily on my chest like concrete blocks being piled onto me one by one. We finally reached the storage shed, discreetly reloading firearms which we had once left behind without even anticipating such dire need for self-defense. Each of us knew that we held a minuscule chance of surviving whatever laid ahead. But it was the only choice we had, for there was no turning back now. The shed was now our makeshift fortress, and we knew we needed to act fast. Weapons tightly gripped in hand, there was no time to think about the eerie antagonists that had brought us into this chaos-filled reality. Instead, we focused on the critical task of making our way out of these woods and finding help. Utilizing my knowledge of navigation techniques, we began moving cautiously, as silently as possible through the dense forest. The terrain proved to be treacherous, filled with hidden obstacles and life-threatening hazards that tested our determination at every turn. Every sound became menacing, Every uncertainty increased our paranoia and amplified our need to reach safety. The creature made its presence known by its relentless pursuit, seeking to annihilate us utterly with every chilling encounter. One moment, we caught sight of it lurking in the shadows, its humanoid form almost too terrifying to comprehend. A guttural growl filled the air as sinister eyes locked onto ours from afar. In an instant, it darted from one spot to another, approaching closer with horrifying speed. Unable to deny my panic state any longer, I remembered I still had my phone within reach. Knowing full well that we needed assistance, I gave in and dialed 911, hoping against all odds for a glimmer of hope in rescue and reinforcements. However, our desperate attempt for help remained futile, the call dropped before we could even communicate our dire situation with the dispatcher. Frustration weighed down upon us as it seemed our only connection to the outside world had been severed. Our distress escalated even further when one member of our group foolishly snapped a twig while attempting to avoid stepping on a venomous snake slithering beside their foot. The noise was undeniably minuscule in comparison to the monstrous roars echoing around us. But it was enough for the creature to locate our position. With alarming severity and precision, the beast charged at us in a single, calculated motion. We scattered in different directions, hoping to avoid the onslaught. Its claws sliced through the air, narrowly missing my companion and leaving them with a thin, bleeding gash on their arm. In the heat of the moment, I fired a round in its direction. To our horror, the bullet had no discernible effect on the adversary, only further infuriating it and threatening our imminent demise. Incapable of fighting this creature with mere human strength and firepower, we found ourselves overwhelmed by dread. Regardless of our fear, our inescapable priority was survival. As individuals of pure instinct, we fought against the nightmare as best we could. 
Each encounter with our lethal pursuer took its toll on us physically and mentally while draining away hope and reducing us to tormented souls caught in an endless loop of violence. During a brief moment of respite from the ceaseless pursuit, my comrades injured but still alive, we finally stumbled upon a highway cutting through the dense foliage before us. It seemed almost surreal that this symbol of civilization appeared like an oasis amidst desolation. Collapsing on asphalt barely within the boundaries of safety, we were ultimately discovered by a passing motorist who immediately alerted emergency services to rescue us from this twisted reality. Though more battered and scared than ever before, relief washed over us like ocean waves crashing into shore. The reality of what we faced continued to haunt us, an encounter that would forever etch itself into our collective psyche. The creature's identity remained a mystery, an enigma from which terrible thoughts crawled into existence through endless speculation concerning its origins. At times, whispers of legends would pass between hushed voices as casual conversation turned to the topic of horror and lore. Speculation arose regarding skinwalkers or shapeshifters as potential explanations for our bizarre ordeal, yet nothing definitive that bore any semblance of credible truth. Instead of dwelling further upon paranormal possibilities outside our comprehension, we embraced the fact that we had survived our nightmare in those forsaken woods. Our gratitude would forever be for the bonds we forged in adversity and the hope that guided us so desperately toward an escape from the abyss of primal terror. This happened to me years ago when I took a solo trip to the remote Black Canyon Forest, located in the heart of Colorado. My name is Elroy Watlington, and back then... I needed a break from the city life and some peace of mind. I arrived at my cabin, nestled deep in the woods, and unpacked my belongings. The next day, while hiking through the forest, I stumbled upon an elderly couple, Norvald and Estel Greengrass. They invited me over to their house for dinner. When I arrived, Norvald told tales of his hunting expeditions while we enjoyed a hearty meal together. As we ate, Estel mentioned that hikers had been disappearing around these woods for years, and nobody could figure out why. She shared that some people believed there was a creature lurking in the shadows, but Norvald and I dismissed her words as local folklore. After spending more evenings with them, Norvald had to take a trip to town leaving Estel alone. She called me over one night when she heard strange noises outside her house. We both went out to investigate but couldn't find anything unusual. Sometime later, a local named Leonid Felsenthal contacted me asking if I'd seen his friend Theron Skovgard who had disappeared while exploring lands nearby. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen Theron and offered my condolences. Leaving no stone unturned in search of Theron, Leonid came across an unnerving sight. Streams of crimson dotted the undergrowth along an unfamiliar trail. Following the trail led us to a small cave entrance with bone fragments scattered around it old and new. A potent stench engulfed the cave mouth as we cautiously entered. The further we ventured in, the more disturbing it became. The cave was littered with mutilated remains of hikers strewn about torn by something with unimaginable force. Panic gripped us as an inhuman guttural growl emanated from the darkness. We heard something rapidly approaching and sprinted towards the entrance. But Leonid tripped, and before my eyes, an enormous beast lunged at him. It was like no creature I had ever seen a monstrous blend of human and beast with mangled fur and sinewy muscles. Its eyes were soul-piercing orbs of hate, while razor-sharp claws dripped with gore. Fleeing back to the cabin, I barricaded the door and called for help. Phone lines were down. Maybe the beast had taken care of that, or perhaps it was just bad luck. 
Esther lived nearby, and I knew I couldn't let her face this monster alone. When I reached Estel's home, she shakily recounted how she had heard Leonid's screams. The horror of it all crystallized in our minds, but we couldn't just abandon Norvald. He was still unaware of this deadly threat. We reached Norvald as he returned from town, breathless and gasping about what had transpired. He ignored anyone suggesting we flee this place as he couldn't leave without avenging Leonid and other victims. So together we formed a plan. Norvald mentioned an emergency stash of weapons inside his truck equipped for such situations hunting rifles, shotguns, even bear traps. We spread across the woods hoping to catch the creature unawares but underestimated its great intelligence. As night fell and our search futilely continued, an immense force hurtled from within the darkness throwing me aside. It latched on to Norvald while Estel screamed in terror. Grappling free from its grasp, Norvald fought back with heavy gunshots each thud echoing through the hollow treescape. The creature howled in its rage within the black shadows, circled cautiously, and lunged again. Norvald managed another shot grazing its arm, causing the beast to flinch and retreat momentarily. My heart pounded in my chest as I knew our battle was far from over. We didn't know what the creature was, but we knew that we couldn't just stand there and let it take Norvald. Estel grabbed one of the bear traps from Norvald's truck, and I managed to get back on my feet after being thrown aside. The noises coming from the creature were unlike anything I had ever heard before. Its growls and snarls were guttural, as if each sound held a lifetime of anger and anguish. It moved with impossible speed, stalking us through the densely packed trees. Estel quickly set up the bear trap in the pathway between Norvald and the creature. The plan was simple. Draw the creature into the trap and immobilize it long enough for Norvald to finish it off with his gun. As the creature lunged toward Norvald once more, he shouted, Here! Over here! It worked. The creature changed direction and headed straight for him. But just as it was about to reach him, it caught sight of the bear trap and skidded to a halt. I couldn't believe my eyes as I watched this beast display an unnervingly human-like intelligence. It screamed in pure frustration at having been outsmarted at least temporarily by its prey. Without missing a beat, Norvald fired at it once more. As bullets entered its body, the creature seemed to momentarily lose control of its shape. Its skin stretched and contracted grotesquely until finally it sprinted back into deeper shadows. As it disappeared, I swore I could hear, Laughter? That thing, what is it? I panted, sweat pouring down my face. I don't know, Norvald admitted through gritted teeth. But we need backup. Using trembling fingers, I dialed emergency services on my phone. When they asked what sort of creature we were dealing with, I had no answers for them. Nevertheless, they sent a heavily armed team, warning us to stay in hiding until they arrived. The chilling chaos continued throughout the woods until the emergency team arrived. Gunshots rang out, followed by shouts and radioed communication between the officers. Norvald, Estel, and I cowered together behind his truck as we anxiously awaited word of their success. Finally, one of the officers approached us. We don't know what that was, he said grimly, but we think we've driven it away. As we collected ourselves and began to leave the area, I couldn't help but wonder be it skinwalker or shapeshifter, whatever that monster was had to come from somewhere. I wasn't naive enough to believe this would be its last attack. A few days later, after countless phone calls to various authorities sharing our experience and seeking answers, it became abundantly clear that these people either didn't know what the creature was or didn't want to admit it. As rumors buzzed through town about an unholy beast lurking in our woods, life had no choice but to go on. 
but none of us could forget what we had witnessed. Norvald struggled to fill the void left by Leonid's passing, and Estel jumped at every shadow. Whatever attacked us in those woods remained a mystery, one that may never be solved. Perhaps that creature is truly an unknown beast or a lost unnatural species lurking in the shadows. All I know is that with each passing day haunted by gruesome memories, I genuinely hope others won't suffer at its hands as Leonid did and pray its next encounter with humans isn't as terrifyingly close as ours were. To Leonid's memory and anyone else who may cross paths with that hauntingly intelligent creature in the future be vigilant, and never underestimate your opponent especially when you find yourself in the depths of a seemingly never-ending darkness. This happened to me a few summers ago at Sterling Creek, a secluded spot in the Appalachian Mountains. There I was, sitting on the porch of my cabin, enjoying a peaceful evening with my friend Orson Gilroy. It's been years since I did anything like this, you know, I said, as I recalled my once adventurous past. Used to pick berries with my grandma out here. The sun started to dip beneath the trees and we decided to take one last hike before nightfall. The sound of crunching leaves beneath our feet was both soothing and nostalgic. Laughing about old times, a sudden scream interrupted our conversation. The gut-wrenching sound emanated from deep in the woods. Orson and I exchanged nervous glances. What was that? he asked, his voice tense. No idea! I replied quickly. But let's check it out. We treaded cautiously through the underbrush in search of the source. As we moved deeper into the woods, we stumbled upon a gruesome scene. Lying on the forest floor was the mutilated body of a man. His face was unrecognizable, ripped apart by some unknown force. This is horrible, Orson murmured with revulsion. We tried calling for help on our cell phones, but to no avail. There were no signals in Sterling Creek's isolated wilderness. We need to get back and find someone who can help, I urged Orson. He agreed reluctantly, beads of sweat forming on his brow. We tried retracing our steps, but darkness was enveloping the forest quickly. We strained our ears for any indication of which way to go town felt impossibly far away now. As we stumbled forward, an eerie growl echoed through the trees. We froze, hearts pounding and heads swiveling towards the sound. From behind a thick trunk emerged a hulking creature, its matted fur caked with dirt and blood. In the dim light, its eyes gleamed with animosity. It stood on muscular hind legs and towered over us, snarling menacingly. It took a step closer, saliva dripping from its powerful jaw. We stood motionless, awestruck by this monstrous being that looked like it had stepped out of a twisted nightmare. Run! I shouted, courage surging through my veins unexpectedly. We dashed through the woods, branches whipping at our faces desperately trying to outrun the creature that was now in pursuit. As we ran, the ground suddenly gave way beneath me. Tumbling into a deep pit, I let out a cry as sharp pain tore through my leg. Orson scrambled down after me and examined my leg. My God! he exclaimed. Your leg is broken! Cursing in agony, I noticed an ominous growl above us our pursuer had found us again. Go! Get help! I urged Orson. You can still make it! I won't leave you! He insisted forcefully. Just go! I screamed, desperate for him to understand. He hesitated for a moment before scaling the pit wall and sprinting away. I struggled to stay calm and think of how to escape this nightmare, but all logic seemed to have abandoned me along with Orson. The creature leaned over the edge of the pit, 
staring at me with murderous intent. I held my breath and looked for something, anything I could use as a weapon. My gaze fell on a sharp rock, which I picked up with great effort due to the pain in my leg. The creature stalked closer, its muscles visibly tensing beneath its rough fur. It possessed human-like eyes that stared at me with an undeniable intelligence, yet its body was twisted and animalistic. The beast had elongated limbs and large claws, which were surely capable of tearing through flesh with ease. In a desperate attempt to survive, I hurled the rock at its snout. The creature yelped in pain and staggered back for a moment. While it recovered from the strike, I tried to push myself up against the pit wall to hide from its line of sight. The creature ignored the distraction and loomed over me once more. As it was about to strike, a gunshot echoed through the woods followed by another howl of pain. Orson had come back with help. The creature retreated from the edge of the pit, snarling in frustration. Orson called out to me from above. Emily, we're going to get you out of there, he promised. I looked on as Orson and two other people arrived at the edge of the pit. He had brought back police officers. They quickly lowered a rope down for me to hold on to while they pulled me up. I gritted my teeth, fighting through the pain from my broken leg as they hoisted me out of my grave-like confinement. Once we reached safety in a clearing where our car was parked, we explained what had happened to the officers, how we'd encountered the creature while hiking and were subsequently attacked by it. One officer jotted down notes, while the other frowned deeply. We've heard reports of animal attacks around here before, he informed us. But nothing like this. Then it hit me this creature could be some sort of skinwalker or shapeshifter. I knew nothing about folklore, but the thought that this monster could have transformed into a human terrified me. Seeing my distress, Orson said to the officers, I'll take her to the hospital. We can give you more details once we know she's okay. The officer who took notes nodded his agreement. We will investigate further and keep you both informed, he assured us. As we drove to the hospital, I looked out the window as the sun began to set on what felt like the longest day of my life. At least I was safe now, and whatever that creature was, it would no longer pursue me. A few days later, Orson visited me in my hospital room. He informed me that the police had unleashed search teams and trained dogs to track down the creature. A corpse resembling a large wolf with severe gunshot wounds had been located not far from where we'd last seen it. They said they couldn't confirm it was anything supernatural, Orson explained. But they are certain that whatever attacked us is now dead. Relief washed over me at his report. Although the thought of skinwalkers or shapeshifters roaming in the wilderness was still terrifying, at least we had survived this ordeal together. Now we needed to move forward and remember those less fortunate than us those who hadn't escaped their own horrific encounters with this monstrous beast. Looking at Orson, I embraced him in a hug for a moment before glancing out of the window at the setting sun. It was time for us both to finally leave this nightmare behind and carry on with our lives. But one thought lingered in my mind how many more skinwalkers or shapeshifters were out there lurking in the shadows. The thought haunted me as I tried to sleep in those first months after our encounter. Nonetheless, life continued, and eventually, the memory of that day began to fade. And though I could never forget the monstrosity we encountered— I learned to live with the knowledge that there were still things outside of our control lurking beyond the limits of what we knew. For all we could do was face our fears head-on and be grateful for the life we had a life that both Orson and I fought tooth and nail to keep. This happened to me just before the sun dipped below the horizon in Scobone, 
Tennessee. After working his monotonous job at the post office all week, Sharif Whitaker and I decided to venture into the thick woods bordering the tiny, isolated town. Hiking deep into the forest, we found a clearing littered with broken branches and signs of mutilation, like something monstrous had been through earlier. You think it's bears? said Sharif, raising an eyebrow as he chewed on some jerky. Doubt it, I replied, brushing a strand of hair from my eyes. I'm Forrest Bramson, by the way. Grew up not too far from here. As we trekked further, darkness began to envelop us. We were miles from any signs of civilization when an unfamiliar creature appeared between the trees. This massive beast bore fur as dark as oil, intimidating claws, and bone-like structures protruding from its spine. The following day, we stumbled upon two campers torn apart by something brutal and relentless. Panic settled into our bones. We need help, cried Esmeralda Wenlock, a third camper we found hiding in utter terror amongst some boulders. We can't get a signal out here. Sharif grumbled as he dialed for emergency assistance in vain on his cell phone. And no close roads to drive. At that heart-wrenching moment, reality began to sink in. We were completely isolated. Overhead hung a tar-black sky dotted with stars. The full moon illuminated only craggy tree silhouettes against desolate shadows. Anticipation rose within us like bile. With no help and our numbers thinning every day, what chance did we have? I grabbed Gregory Lomberg, another camper trembling with horror, by the shoulder and whispered tersely, Whatever it is that's hunting us isn't normal. Keep your eyes and ears open. Huddled together in our makeshift camp, we waited in paralyzing fear. In the surrounding woods lurked the beast— undeniably intelligent and cunning in its unseen movements. A guttural growl pierced the silence. I want my mom, whispered Esmeralda, voice thick with unshed tears. Sharif gripped his pistol tightly, knuckles paling. We set out once more, with each step intensifying the prevalent dread looming heavy over our weary and terrified group. The creature seemed to toy with us, every shrill cry eerily echoing through the still darkness like a chilling symphony of terror and agony. Days sprawled into dark nights with no reprieve in sight. It savagely murdered Greta Farnsworth as she weakly called for help, whispering her last words with blood staining her lips. There was no time to grieve, only time to try and preserve our own lives. The monster continued to torment us ruthlessly, gnawing on Joel Winthrop's torso like a gruesome Halloween treat. Our dwindling group forged on, hearts pounding a furious rhythm against ribs and sweat dripping like tears of guilt from bruised faces. Those that remained suffered grueling days reeking of terror, and stifling nights that choked any semblance of hope we may have once possessed. It seemed that each brutal assault fueled the menacing creature's insatiable hunger for violence, its thirst for blood and unquenchable flame thirsty for human misery. Suddenly, as fast as it had appeared, strangely calm skies paled into a nauseating mixture of pinkish-gray hues where we sweltered beneath Southern Rig's pass oppressive heat. Burned on to our memories were the nightmarish events we couldn't shake free. We trudged onward, pursued by memories of clenched jaws and screams of agony that rang endlessly in our ears. And as dappled daylight stretched into another gloomy twilight, we were plunged once again into a volatile environment where the villainous beast toyed with its human prey. In the midst of our desperate journey, Sharif uttered some haunting truths. Folks will never know our names when we're gone. Just another group of faceless victims lost to unforgiving wilderness. We must resist, I whispered, a spark reigniting within me. We need to soldier on, no matter how bleak the outlook. The creature stalked us relentlessly, 
seemingly immune to fatigue as it attacked our group again and again. It was a large, muscular beast with matted fur that smelled of stale blood and death. Its eyes burned like embers in the night, striking fear into the souls of those who dared to look upon it. One by one, our numbers dwindled as the creature's violent onslaught wore them down. Calls for help fell on deaf ears as the overwhelming fear of our situation clouded our judgment and prevented rational thought. Sharif hobbled along next to me, nursing a deep gash on his leg from an earlier attack. The wound seemed infected, turning a grisly shade of green, and each step dug at his body in agonizing throbs of pain. Neither of us knew how much longer we could keep moving. A distant howl from behind us spurred our tired feet forward as panic gripped once again. I can't do this anymore. Sharif gasped between labored breaths. It's going to kill us all. We have to keep going. I urged him. Maybe we can find help up ahead. But it seemed fate had other plans for us. Just as I finished my sentence, another chilling growl sounded mere inches away from Sharif's ear. Without warning, the creature lunged from the shadows and seized Sharif's wounded leg in its powerful jaws. It yanked him away with sickening force before I could react. I was helpless to do anything but watch as Sharif disappeared into the darkness, my gut churning with the knowledge that he was gone forever. Desperation fueled my steps as I pushed through intense pain and exhaustion. Unable to fight back or seek assistance, survival was my only goal. Soon, I stumbled upon a highway where a truck driver spotted my battered form and pulled over to offer assistance. What happened? he asked in disbelief upon seeing my condition. I, I don't know. I stuttered, unable to fully comprehend the nightmare that had befallen us. The driver, a kind soul named Dale, took pity on me and insisted on taking me to the nearest town. As we drove away from Southern Riggs Pass, I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was watching. Perhaps it was displeased with my escape, or perhaps it savored the sensation of terror I couldn't suppress. Whether or not it ever pursued me again remained unknown. Dale took me to a small hospital in the nearest town where I received medical attention for my wounds. With no official identification or means of contacting my family, I was left to navigate this world alone. Grief clung to me like a second skin as I waited through the seemingly endless days that followed. My heart ached for Sharif and others who had lost their lives to that grotesque monster lurking within Southern Riggs Pass. They were gone but not forgotten. Unable to shed light on the true nature of our attacker or find answers behind its existence, I was forced to live with an unsettling uncertainty that gnawed at me day and night. There were times when I dared to imagine our predator as something otherworldly, perhaps a shapeshifter or skinwalker from ancient myth. But these thoughts led only to further despair as I struggled with emotions far too complex and overwhelming for any semblance of understanding. Life continued in whatever manner it saw fit. As days turned into months and months into years, one thing remained constant— the utter impossibility of moving past what occurred within those unforgiving wildernesses near Southern Riggs Pass. Whatever malevolent force lay dormant there eagerly awaited its next victim, lurking in the shadows and savoring their impending doom. My escape brought no relief from that reality, only an unyielding sorrow for those whose fates were sealed within the depths of darkness. Never would I forget Southern Riggs Pass or the monstrous being that called it home. They forever haunted the recesses of my mind, a chilling reminder of horrors once faced and Earth's unknown dangers that refused to be explained. This happened to me eight days ago. I stood at the entrance of Gila Wilderness, New Mexico, 
excited to escape city life for the weekend. My name's Huxley O'Shea, and although I had a demanding job as an ER nurse, my love for nature always pulled me back into the woods. I ventured deeper, the sun gradually retreating below the horizon. Soon, I found my camping spot and pitched my tent. As I gathered firewood nearby, I stumbled upon a backpack hidden amongst the foliage. Curiosity peaked. I opened it to find various items, climbing gear, clothes, and a handwritten journal belonging to Cassie Bildmore. Her entries spoke of strange occurrences, a massive creature stalking her through the wilderness, leaving violated corpses behind that bore unidentifiable markings. Though skeptical, an unease crept over me. That night, as I sat by the fire, I crossed paths with Jonah Markham. He happened upon my campsite while traversing the wilderness as part of his annual retreat from his monotonous office job. Seeking company in this eerie place, we shared dinner and swapped stories. As darkness enveloped us entirely, we heard crackling in the brush nearby. Fear rippled through our bones as we spoke in hushed tones. Yeah, Jonah whispered softly. Been about three years since my wife left me with nothing but this Bushwick Bill CD. But hey, he added with a chuckle trying to lighten the mood. At least she left me something. Inclining his head towards the undergrowth, he whispered. Did you hear about those bodies found around here? Strange markings on them. Gives me chills just thinking about it. Moments later, a shuffling sound amplified our anxiety. Instinctively grasping for weapons, trekking poles, we stood alert when an immense shadow emerged from the darkness. The creature, larger than any man, loomed before us with claws like knives and a snarl that could make death seem sweet. It wasted no time, darting towards Jonah who let out a gut-wrenching scream. I darted deeper into the wilderness, blindly navigating my path, hoping it wouldn't pursue me. After some time I found a hollow in a tree and squeezed into it, sweat clinging to my skin. I listened intently as branches snapped and leaves rustled all around. Two days passed with only the sound of my heartbeat for company. The first time I risked leaving was in search of water. As I emerged onto a stream bed, examining the rocks for signs of moisture, I caught sight of Layla's mothers across the water clutching her rifle in terror. She spoke of a disturbing experience, similar to what Jonah and I had encountered and wondered if this creature was responsible for her friend's recent disappearance. We both stiffened at the echo of footsteps approaching us from behind. Panic churned in our stomachs as we searched for cover near the dried-up stream bed. Suddenly a conversational banter filled the air. Oh, Frida! Isn't it wonderful to be off-grid? I wish we could do this yearly. Layla and I shared horrified glances as we recognized the voice of Maisie Chambers. She and Frida Hansen were Cassie Biltmore's hiking companions whose bodies were yet to be found. We had no choice but to share our knowledge of the creature, although certain they wouldn't believe us. Hearing our story left them wary but intrigued. It wasn't long before night fell again, and we prepared ourselves for whatever horror it might bring. Layla kept watch with her rifle while Maisie explored nearby ruins using an old lantern she'd brought along. Night had fallen, and I kept my eyes fixed on the darkness that surrounded us. The cold air made it difficult to stay focused, but I knew we had to prepare for the creature's return. Layla's rifle was within reach, and Maisie continued her exploration nearby. Frida stuck close, her eyes scanning our surroundings for any signs of danger. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream tore through the night. We all froze, instantly alert. The direction from which the scream came was clear. Something had happened to Maisie. Thinking quickly, Layla grabbed her rifle and we cautiously moved towards the sound, 
staying low to avoid drawing attention to ourselves. As we approached the ruins Maisie had been exploring, an awful sight greeted us torn clothes and bloody drag marks on the ground hinted at a brutal attack. We didn't dare make a sound for fear of attracting the creature's attention if it was still close by. Our awareness of each other's presence was all we needed. I looked around for something, anything that might help us escape this nightmare. Frida whispered urgently, Layla, your phone. Can you try calling for help? Maybe we have a signal now. She checked her phone, but there was still no reception. Disappointment visible in her eyes, she shook her head and uttered a quiet, No. Defeated in our attempts to contact help, we decided to stay together and tried to find shelter until daylight. We moved further into the ruins, seeking a place to hide from the creature that had mercilessly killed our friends. Finally finding what appeared to be an abandoned bunker-like structure, we cautiously entered. There wasn't enough room for all three of us in there but it was better than being out in the open. We quietly told each other what had happened since we last saw one another in an attempt to piece together information about this creature without giving away our hiding spot. As we shared our experiences, we came to a horrifying realization. This creature was not only dangerous but eerily intelligent. It seemed to understand our physical limitations and would stalk us when we were at our weakest, most vulnerable moments. The idea that it could understand our thoughts and emotions was enough to send shivers down my spine. With limited knowledge about folklore and creatures similar to skinwalkers or shapeshifters, all we could do was make educated guesses about the true nature of what hunted us. We felt helpless and stuck, unsure if there was a way to stop it. When the first light of morning began to break through the darkness— we knew staying in the bunker was no longer an option. We needed to take action or risk becoming victims like our friends. Guys, I think I have an idea, whispered Layla. If this creature knows when we're vulnerable, maybe we can lure it into a trap where we have control. Her voice wavered with fear but determination to fight back. We briefly discussed how to set up an ambush using anything we could find but Layla's plan had a flaw. One of us had to act as bait a dangerous role that none wanted. Aware that it might be the only chance for survival, I reluctantly volunteered to act as the bait, while Layla and Frida would hide with her rifle ready for a clear shot. Evening arrived again as we prepared our trap. My heart was pounding in my chest. I tried my best not to show how terrified I was while moving into position. The creature approached with terrifying speed and agility. As soon as it was close enough, Layla took her shot the bullet met its mark, sending the creature crashing into the ground. Its gruesome features were clearer than ever in its final moments. Long limbs, black eyes sunk deep within its skull, skin stretched tight over protruding bones. We couldn't determine if it was a skinwalker, shapeshifter, or something else entirely, but we knew the nightmare had ended. In the aftermath of our ordeal, we buried our fallen friends with heavy hearts. Those gruesome memories now serve as a reminder of friends lost and a harrowing experience survived against an unknown terror that lurks in the darkness. This happened to me a while ago, alone in an isolated cabin near Jacob's Point, deep within the thick pine forest of Idaho. My name's Wayland Thackeray, and I had gone on a much-needed retreat from my hectic life in Los Angeles. Day one passed without event. I explored the serene surroundings and breathed in the crisp air as I hiked along the meandering trails nearby. The trees rustled faintly as if whispering secrets to one another. As night fell, I sat on the porch with a steaming mug of coffee, 
contemplating life when my neighbor Bartleby Godwin from a cabin a mile away came to introduce himself. He shared with me the story of a creature said to stalk these woods, a hideous thing with piercing red eyes and razor-sharp claws. It moved like a shadow on the edge of vision, swift and silent, and those who crossed its path were never seen again. Bartleby showed me the deep scratch marks on his sturdy oak door, which he claimed were made by this beast. Bart's been known to exaggerate over his moonshine, I thought to myself. No point in taking it too seriously. As days came and went, I ventured deeper into the woods. The birds' songs filled my ears. Their melodies resonated through blissful silence. Tiny wildflowers swayed gently in the breeze as squirrels darted between tree trunks, an idyllic scene straight out of a painting. One day, while exploring a particularly dense stand of pines, I stumbled upon a grisly scene, a torn-up campsite with scattered pieces of clothing, smashed camping gear, and dried blood staining the ground. Appalled and shaken, I pushed aside my initial skepticism about Bartleby's tale. That evening, I spoke with him about my discovery on phone since he was visiting his grandchildren that day. Waylon, he said in a hushed tone, tell nobody about this. We don't need hysteria scaring folks away from Jacob's point. Just be careful out here, all right? Following Bartleby's counsel, I took extra precautions while in the woods, armed with a boar hunting knife borrowed from him. Each rustle of the bushes and snapping twig intensified my growing apprehension. The next day, Bartleby asked if I'd accompany him on an errand to his nearby friend Geraldine Alla's remote homestead to check on the elderly lady since her phone had been unreachable, which wasn't unusual due to their off-grid setting. As we approached Geraldine's home by foot, her driveway lay twisted and narrow, the air felt unnervingly still. Funny how quiet is it, said Bartleby. The front door was flung wide open, banging rhythmically against the wall as icy gusts whipped through the house. Geraldine was nowhere to be found. Only chaos remained in her wake, overturned furniture, shattered dishes, a toppled lamp with its bulb shattered. Broken glass crunched beneath our boots as we stepped cautiously into the desecrated dwelling. We searched the nearby woods for any sign of her presence when we stumbled upon a tattered piece of her flannel nightgown caught on a thorny blackberry bush beside a trail of erratic footprints leading deeper into the forest. There's nothing more we can do here, Bartleby muttered gravely. Let's inform the authorities. I pray she ain't in too much danger. The eerie silence that hung like a thick cloud around us as we trekked back to my cabin that day sent shivers down my spine. After notifying local law enforcement about Geraldine's predicament, Bartleby returned home before sundown. I spent that evening in half-hearted meditation and uneasy solitude. The calm surrounding my once-beloved cabin now wrought a tense anxiety in my core. My ears pricked as a sudden noise pierced the silence, a shrill, distant scream that could not be denied. It sounded like no animal I knew. Could it be Geraldine? I wondered, my heart beat thundering louder with fear. I sprang to my feet, heart pounding, and grabbed my phone. I hesitated for a moment, recalling Bartleby's departure and how it would be impossible for him to offer help in time. Instead, I dialed the local police station. Something's wrong. I gasped into the phone when the operator answered. I heard a scream in the woods near my cabin. We might have more information about Geraldine. The operator assured me someone would be dispatched immediately but the anticipation was unbearable as the seconds crawled by. I paced nervously, straining to hear any further sounds from the forest. More screams haunted my mind. Finally, flashing lights signaled the arrival of Officers Warren and Jensen, with whom Bartleby and I had spoken earlier. 
They exited their vehicles with an air of urgency and approached me. We'll search the woods, Officer Warren stated matter-of-factly. Stay here and lock your door. We don't need you becoming another victim. Though their words were pragmatic, they did little to ease my trepidation as I watched them disappear into the woodland shadows. Sleep didn't come easily that night. Every creak and rustle outside left me bolt upright in bed, drenched in cold sweat. Time seemed to slow to a crawl as I waited for dawn. When news finally arrived of Geraldine's fate, it was as grim as I'd feared. Her lifeless body was discovered deep in the woods, her injuries too grisly to fully describe. Bartleby stumbled into my cabin looking pale and shaken shortly after hearing of Geraldine's demise. The officers had informed him that something beyond human comprehension was responsible for her death, something monstrous that no human could fight back against. Officer Jensen filled us in on further details from the scene. There were deep gashes across dark fur, mutilation like nothing he had ever encountered before, things too disturbing to comprehend. Whatever had killed Geraldine seemed to be either human nor animal, but a ghastly amalgamation of the two. Skinwalker and Shapeshifter, myths that had no place in reality, slipped into my mind but were immediately dismissed. Such uncanny creatures were mere figments of folklore. In the following days, I kept in close contact with Bartleby and stayed mostly indoors. Fear permeated every thought and action even inside my own home. I began to question my decision not to call for help that fateful night. One evening, as I sat in my cabin huddled by the fire, a knock came at the door. Peering outside, I saw it was Bartleby, a grim expression etched on his face. They found another body, he whispered hoarsely. Pete, the shopkeeper. Same, same thing as Geraldine. Silence settled heavily around us as we absorbed the horrifying truth. Whatever creature existed in our midst was not satisfied with Geraldine alone. It had claimed another victim. Discussions of evacuation began circulating through town. No one knew what horror they faced but fleeing seemed the safest option rather than waiting for death to visit them next. Under this pressing terror, Bartleby and I said our farewells as he left to follow the rest of the community's exodus from certain doom. It all still felt surreal like some nightmare that refused to end. What could possibly create such horror? Thoughts raced through my mind unbidden but offered no answers. As for me... I packed up what was valuable and dear to my heart and abandoned my once beloved cabin in favor of safety far from whatever lurked in those cursed woods. Years later, we have no definitive explanation for what tore those lives apart on those cold autumn nights whether it was something beyond reason or simply a mad human driven by sadistic urges. Some tales are better left as mysteries and this was one I never dared to investigate further. But for those who lost their lives to that gruesome evil in the woods, their memories remain seared deep within my mind a chilling reminder of how some tragedies are impossible to comprehend fully. This happened to me a while back in the isolated Gaviota Creek area, tucked away in a dense forest on the Californian coast. My name is Gilbert Archfield, and I used to work as a city investigator. Opening my own private investigation firm was always the dream. Needing a break before my new venture, I retreated to this hidden gem of nature, seeking solace. I arrived at my cabin and met Oscar Flauden, a helpful local, and Henrietta Wenlow, the proprietor of the only store around. We struck an interesting conversation about life in the city versus their quiet existence. During my stay, odd occurrences began. Vague whispers circulated about eerie sounds heard during the night, 
screeches and unsettling crashes that left some residents sleepless. Venturing deeper into the forest one afternoon, determined to uncover what was happening, I found massive claw marks on trees and gouges in the soil. In that moment, I realized we were dealing with something beyond human comprehension. At dusk, while sharing my observations with Oscar and Henrietta, our conversation was interrupted by agonized screams nearby. We rushed toward the source of screams. There was no time to call for help. Nearing its origin, we discovered grisly remains of an unidentified individual. We reported it to authorities visiting from a nearby town but chose not to reveal my findings from earlier. As an investigator, my intuition suggested secrecy at least until more evidence surfaced. We continued delving into the area's mysteries as darkness swathed the nightly in fearful silence. Days turned to weeks as unexplained incidents mounted incessantly. Why was this happening? What unearthly presence lurked among those woods? In every ensuing event crashes closely followed by gut-churning shrieks we found tangible evidence of a distinct pattern indicative of an animalistic creature relentless in its pursuit. With each repetition, panic intensified as our desolate hamlet twisted into a horrific nightmare. Our conversations as friends grew anchored by the traumatic daily events. Laughter with them was spent reminiscing simpler times and sharing humorous anecdotes. But escape was fleeting, reality ever-present. One moonlit evening, we saw something which altered our perceptions irrevocably. In the treeline shadows, a towering figure emerged. Muscles quivered beneath its matted fur as it stalked forward, claws corrosively dripping with some unidentifiable substance onto the sizzling forest floor. The creature lumbered menacingly with eyes that pierced the darkness. It scraped obsidian claws against tree trunks to sharpen them in anticipation of further carnage. It never uttered a word or made any discernible vocalizations, solely communicating through grunts as it moved through the underbrush. This encounter filled us with fear and curiosity. This creature rooted in realism wreaked unbelievable havoc on our previously undisturbed village. Bound by the shared truth of its existence, we concocted meticulous plans intending to defend our home. Days trickled by. Nights became a cacophony of cries echoing through the timberline while residents disappeared one by one. Local authorities grew weary from fruitless efforts to protect those left behind from an unprecedented predator's wrath. As a seasoned investigator, I clung to logic, endeavoring to rationalize events unfolding before me yet even my most meticulously considered hypothesis fell apart in the face of such unrelenting carnage. The creature attacked relentlessly but methodically, stalking its targets intelligently and systematically dismantling their lives piece by piece until nothing remained but terror in its wake. As our numbers dwindled and government assistance floundered to offer viable solutions, we began feeling powerless and desperate for an end to this nightmare. With each passing day morphing into wretched night, our greatest fear was that this heinous being would devour us all or force us to endure another merciless onslaught. One evening, following several hours of careful preparation, Oscar, Henrietta, and I trekked deep into the woods. We solemnly confronted a creature unprecedented a vile beast responsible for the decimation of our tranquil existence. Our limited weaponry clutched in trembling hands paled at our enemy's unspeakable power, but together, we could face anything. No authorities would come to our rescue now. It was up to us to stand and fight the menace before it eradicated our community forever. We continued further into the woods, unsure of what awaited us. As we approached a clearing, we heard rustling in the bushes nearby. Oscar and Henrietta who once had the fiercest resolve, now looked at each other with worry etched across their faces. I felt the same fear but tried to push it back, 
reminding myself that I had no choice but to move forward. The creature emerged from its hiding place, and the sight of it left us speechless. It was both monstrous and bizarre, unlike any animal we had ever seen before. Its body was covered in a coarse, dark fur that ended in a set of twisted limbs with frighteningly sharp claws. Its twisted grimace revealed rows of jagged teeth dripping with blood from its previous victims. But most unnerving were its eyes, an unnatural shade of amber that seemed to burn with malicious intent. Though it looked vaguely wolf-like in appearance, something was distinctly off about it. With such peculiar features and capabilities that went beyond ordinary animal intelligence or behavior, I could only assume those legends about skinwalkers or shapeshifters that I had brushed off earlier might be closer to home than I once thought. Oscar, I whispered through clenched teeth. Did you say your uncle worked at the fire department? With a hesitant nod, he responded. Yeah. We need to alert them. I said urgently. They might be able to help or at least buy us some time. Though agreeing with me, Oscar hesitated in calling for help as his hand trembled over the phone. He finally spoke up fearfully, saying, It seemed impossible. Those tales we've heard always seem so far away from reality. Do you think they'll even believe us? Perhaps not, Henrietta interjected but we can't afford to not try. As Oscar summoned the courage to call his uncle at the fire department, the creature began to circle us, as though deciding which of its would be prey to stalk first. We didn't have much time. We needed help as soon as possible before we became its next meal. Not five minutes later, we witnessed Oscar's uncle and his team of firefighters arriving at the scene. At first skeptical about the situation, the sight of the creature quickly changed their minds. They attempted to contain it within a ring of fire, hoping for the flames to discourage any attempt at escape. To our horror, however, the beast was unfazed by the fire. The firefighters watched in terror as the creature tore into one of their own. The sight of such gore and violence left us all with a sick feeling in our stomachs. Realizing that they were no match for the abomination before them, they began to retreat. But I knew I couldn't allow this thing to continue its reign of terror, and decided that even if I couldn't kill it, at least I could lead it away from our community. I shouted at the creature and threw a rock in its direction to grab its attention. To my amazement, it seemed to work, causing it to focus on me instead of attacking anyone else. As it pursued me through the woods, branches whipped my face as adrenaline coursed through my veins. My heartbeat rang loudly in my ears coupled with each breath I struggled to take while running further away from our town. In that desperate race for my life and those around me, I realized that there was no turning back. My fate was sealed with each mile I crossed deeper into unknown territory. I could only pray that whatever end crept upon me would be mercifully quick. As I entered unfamiliar grounds further from our community with this thing charging ever persistently behind me, I found myself wishing that we would have reacted earlier and found some way to stop it before more lives were lost. Oscar and Henrietta's faces flashed before me, but so too did the faces of friends and neighbors we lost in days past. Wishing desperately for their memory to never be forgotten, I pressed onwards, praying for a miracle that would save us all. This happened to me about a decade ago. I was visiting a remote cabin in the dense forests of Alaska, far from civilization. My name is Cassius O'Connell, and I'm a journalist by trade, always seeking unique stories. The off-the-grid location sat on the banks of a narrow stream, surrounded by towering evergreens. Nature was its only neighbor, bringing stillness and solitude to my days here. 
As I sat on the porch, hummingbirds fluttered by and squirrels dashed through the bushes. One day, I met locals Claudius and Elspeth Vanek who told me about recent unnerving events. They mentioned some folks went missing while backpacking in these woods not too long ago. Nobody knew what happened, but something strange was going on. I decided to investigate further. The three of us searched the woods together, hoping to find any clues or evidence. Our steps were cautious, though they sounded like thunder as we broke the silence that shrouded this place. Be careful, Claudius whispered as we navigated a thorny patch. His eyes darted around the dense foliage. As we continued our search, we found an old campsite— abandoned and disheveled with torn tents and scattered belongings. A haunting chill ran down my spine as I imagined the terror that came to claim those unsuspecting hikers. Elspeth picked up a muddy pair of glasses from the ground. "'Wonder what happened here?' she murmured. After hours of searching with nothing more than eerie echoes for company, we decided to call it a day." As night fell upon us and our flashlight beams carved paths through the darkness, we felt vulnerable no technology could save us from whatever lurked in these twisted shadows. As days passed and our investigation evolved, we found unnerving clues, blood-soaked clothing hidden beneath tree roots, scratched messages etched into trunks crying for help. The plot thickened, with each tidbit feeding our curiosity and fear in equal measure. One afternoon, while Claudius rested against a tree, cracking jokes to ease the tension, I heard Elspeth gasp and point to the distance. Squinting my eyes, I could barely make out a large, hulking figure deep within the shadows. My heart thundered within my chest as it moved closer. It was unlike anything I had ever seen— an enormous creature with an animal's head, long sinewy limbs, and massive gnarled claws, frighteningly unnatural yet reminiscent of familiar animals. We hid behind a decaying log, watching it skulk through the trees with predatory fluidity. Its movements were silent despite its size, its intense gaze seemingly oblivious to our presence. I could hear Claudius and Elspeth's labored breathing as we clutched each other for support, daring not to breathe too loudly for fear of alerting the monstrosity. The creature stopped suddenly near a bush, where it stooped down and snatched a small rabbit hiding beneath the leaves. It tore into its prey mercilessly right before our horrified eyes as we fought to hold back our gasps of terror. After devouring its meal— it inexplicably turned toward us, its gaze paralyzing us with primal fear. It took a deliberate step forward as if preparing to pounce when Elspeth's shaking hands slipped from mine, giving us away. The creature's ears twitched at the subtle sound and its dark eyes locked onto ours, instantly discovering our hiding place. The world around us fell silent except for one thing— our pounding hearts threatening to burst within our chests. In a sudden rush of panic, we scrambled to our feet and took off running through the woods, desperately hoping to escape the creature's notice. Claudius led the way, navigating us through the thick undergrowth as quickly as possible. Elspeth trailed behind me. I could hear her footsteps growing heavier with each passing moment. As adrenaline coursed through my veins, I couldn't shake the image of the creature's gruesome feast from my mind. The air vibrated with the tension as our breaths and footsteps echoed through the otherwise silent forest. We didn't dare to look back, afraid that one glance would be all it took for the creature to catch us. Racing forward, Claudius suddenly slowed his pace and signaled for us to stop. Look, he whispered pointing toward a cabin in the clearing ahead. We can hide in there. Despite our desperate circumstances, we hesitated for a moment before bolting toward our only chance for refuge. Upon crossing the threshold into the dim cabin, we found ourselves in an abandoned yet surprisingly intact living space. 
terrified that windows and doors would be insufficient protection against a monstrous predator, we dragged furniture over entrances to barricade ourselves inside. As we huddled together in the corner waiting for any sign of danger, Elspeth suddenly spoke in a trembling voice. What was that thing? It looked like some kind of shapeshifter or skinwalker. Claudius shook his head slowly, replying somberly. I don't know much about folklore or creatures like that, but whatever that monstrosity was seen beyond anything found in superstition. My stomach churned at their words, both cold comfort as it reminded us that no one would readily believe our story if we managed to make it out alive. The hours crept by slowly intense silence as we listened to any indications of movement outside the cabin. When darkness fell, an eerie stillness gripped the already tense atmosphere. Suddenly, our fragile silence was shattered by the sound of heavy footsteps outside the cabin. We exchanged terrified glances as we heard the external barricades being ripped apart by whatever monstrous force hid within the shadows. Our hearts thumped with wild beats as we prepared for the worst. Claudius grabbed a hunting knife from a nearby shelf gripping it with white-knuckled determination. He whispered to us, Stay here. If I don't make it back, get help. Before we could protest, Claudius crept out of our hiding spot to face the creature head-on. Elspeth and I clung to each other in fear, our breaths shallow and frantic. Moments later, we heard a horrifying screech followed by Claudius's gut-wrenching scream. Tears streaming down our faces, Elspeth and I made an unspoken agreement. We would not wait any longer for help. We had to escape. Slipping through the forest under cover of darkness, we hoped against hope that whatever fate befell Claudius would grant us time to reach safety. Our thoughts were consumed by guilt and fear. Still, we refused to let his sacrifice be in vain. The distant lights of a nearby village became visible through the trees, providing our exhausted minds a sliver of hope. With that sight guiding us forward, we found ourselves stumbling into safety with newfound determination. The village locals were understandably skeptical of our tale. Nevertheless, they offered sympathy as they treated the scrapes and bruises obtained during our harrowing ordeal. In mourning for Claudius and unable to shake the haunting images of that night from memory, Elspeth and I shared an unbreakable bond forged in terror and grief. With a sorrowful nod between us on one final morning in the village, we set out together on a mission to reveal the truth of the monstrous creature that stalked the woods, hoping to prevent its reign of bloodshed from claiming more innocent lives. This happened to me a few years back, at the isolated outpost cabin in Alaska. My name is Amias Oakenforth, a recently divorced man looking for solitude. I went there with my two friends, Otis Brixley and Zeno Kincaid, who insisted on making this trip a healing experience for me. We loved the cabin's picture-perfect location, set deep within the sprawling woods. The lush forest surrounding us invited exploration. One day, as we hiked along the riverbank just beyond our cabin, we found a seemingly abandoned campsite with torn tents and bloodstains on the ground. My friends and I exchanged worried glances before Otis cracked a joke, just typical of him in tense situations. No need to Sherlock around here. Place looks like a bear had too much tequila. Otis proposed. We concurred and continued hiking but remained extra vigilant during our outdoor escapades. Things settled relatively quickly until our fourth night when we heard something marauding outside the cabin. There it is again, whispered Zeno, nervously glancing at his shotgun leaning against the wall. Remnants of previous meals were laid out on the outdoor table like an invitation for an unwanted guest. 
We decided to wake up early to assess any damage done and call park rangers if necessary. Our morning investigation revealed peculiarly large claw marks around our food supplies. Otis concluded it was from an unusually hungry beast and that we should fathomably protect ourselves further. Immediately following this revelation, Zeno's shotgun took center stage in our secluded lives. A few days later, hiking far away from our initial find, my foot brushed against an unnervingly rough patch of dirt amid mossy undergrowth. I called Otis and Zeno over before brushing more leaves away to unveil another chilling scene. Crumpled tents littered among branches torn violently from trees surrounding the area. A bear on tequila wouldn't stand a chance against this mess. Otis quipped, but we all shared the same frightened look in our eyes. It wasn't long before our dread manifested itself into an unmistakable, malicious presence lurking in the shadows. Its intent couldn't be fathomed, but it would appear in the corners of our eyes, vanish abruptly each time Zeno lifted his shotgun. My friends began questioning my sanity as I started feeling watched during our hiking excursions. I finally had a chance to confront the lurking figure before me on a solo hike further into the woods. Out of nowhere, an unexpected force bowled me over and pinned me to the ground. Staring back at me were red orbs glowing above a grisly, hideous face, something far worse than my wildest nightmares. This creature bore immense weight along its muscular frame, with coarse hair matted onto discolored skin scarred by untold battles. It bared gnashing fangs within its twisted maw and released a guttural growl. I remained motionless as it loomed above me. The deep scratches across its chest suddenly began to flay open. The creature threw back its head and roared in agony before bounding away into the dark wilderness. I scrambled back to my feet, taking off towards the cabin while gasping for breath. Otis and Zeno were waiting there, their eyes widened with disbelief as they listened to my frenetic account. Amy is, this doesn't make any sense. No creature like that exists in Alaska, or anywhere. Zeno protested, gripping his shotgun tighter while pacing the room. Dissatisfied with lack of background noise in the tense cabin, Otis shouted for assistance and waved desperately at his phone that barely received any signals due to our spatial separation from civilization. As we sat waiting for help that might never come, our jittery bundle of nerves were offset by various attempts at humor. Otis suggested one last hike to search for signs of escaping campers that could have survived. Just as we geared up and stepped out, a plume of fog rolled in, drowning our surroundings in the gloomy haze. Otis led the way, intricately trekking ahead while making sure his friends followed closely behind. Suddenly, an ear-splitting howl pierced the air, and raged roars followed swiftly as a monstrous creature swiped at Otis with furious accuracy. The creature's razor-sharp claws lashed at Otis, tearing into his flesh as he screamed in pain. Zeno and I tried to reach him, but the fog seemed to be getting denser, disorienting us. The demonic roars of the monstrous beast echoed around us, preventing us from discerning the direction from which they were coming. In a frantic rush, we eventually found Otis. His shredded body sprawled on the ground, seeping blood all around. Zeno clasped his hands together and called for help once more while I desperately attempted to stanch the flow of blood from Otis' grievous wounds. Zeno received a response on his phone the screen flickering with an indication that someone received our message for assistance. We knew that we would have to hold out until help arrived. Time became a blur as we tried our best to keep Otis alive and ourselves safe. The thunderous footsteps of the beast reverberated all around us, taunting us with its presence while remaining just out of sight. Strange guttural noises filled the air making it difficult for us to communicate or pinpoint where it was hiding. 
Just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, Zeno dropped his shotgun while fending off an unseen attacker. We watched in horror as it fell into a chasm that had appeared before us an eerie abyss belching forth fog. We were left weaponless and vulnerable to this mysterious creature's wrath. When hope seemed lost, headlights approached in the distance through the mist. A vehicle screeched to a halt, too late for Otis but just in time for Zeno and me. We were pulled into the safety of its metal confines while professional hunters armed with rifles fanned out into the darkness. As we drove away from the horrifying scene with emotions in turmoil, chaos ensued between reality and what we had just experienced. The idea of a shapeshifter came crashing down on me like a ton of bricks. I shuddered at the thought, struggling to rationalize the events. Zeno and I spent days recounting our ordeal in hopes of finding a semblance of clarity. We were both aware that we could never truly comprehend what happened those few days in Alaska. Was it a legendary skinwalker, or something else that lurked in the woodlands? Could it have been a malformed bear or wolf? Weeks later, as we tried to adjust to our new reality and mourn the loss of Otis, I received an unexpected package. Inside was a note written in hurried handwriting. Found near your campsite. Study and learn next time you might not be so lucky. Beneath the note was a book about ancient creatures and myths. Flipping through its old pages, I found sketches that resembled our antagonistic predator and descriptions that matched its ferocious nature. My newfound knowledge couldn't save Otis or change the past, but it fueled my resolve to understand the nightmare that haunted us and prevent it from harming others. This happened to me a long time ago, deep in the remote wilderness of Alaska. I found myself alone and far from civilization, living among the beauty of nature in a small, off-the-grid cabin. My name is Kester Bergen, a city dweller who needed an escape. I had spent most of my career as an accountant, working long hours in a cramped office with unrelenting deadlines. I decided it was time to do something radical. I saved up some money, bought the cabin sight unseen, and retreated to a simpler life. The area around my new home was breathtaking. Tall, dense evergreens surrounded the cabin, their branches extending high into the clear sky. A cold mountain stream snaked through the greenery nearby, providing a steady supply of water that proved vital for daily life. As days turned into weeks, I got acquainted with my nearest neighbors, Staunton Renshaw and his wife Fleury. Their cabin was a mile down an unmarked dirt path from mine. With their seasoned knowledge of wilderness living, they kindly helped me acclimate to my new surroundings. One chilly night after dinner at the Renshaw's cabin, we heard something strange. It sounded like an animal roaring or wailing but unlike anything we had ever encountered in these woods. Any idea what that could be? I asked Staunton nervously. He furrowed his brow for a moment before replying. It might be just a bear or wolf call that's echoing differently through these hills. But it continued. Night after night we were unnerved by this unsettling sound. Then one day tragedy struck. Fleury disappeared while picking berries near their cabin. Staunton organized search parties and scanned every inch of our land. She had seemingly vanished without a trace. Concerned for our own safety, Staunton and I decided to venture out together one evening with our guns to investigate the calls we suspected might be connected to Fleury's disappearance. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the air grew colder and the noise seemed to circulate around us, enveloping us in a haunting chorus. My pulse began to race. I could tell Staunton was also edgy. The underbrush rustled behind us. We scrambled and spun around with weapons poised, 
only to find ourselves confronted by an unfamiliar creature. It stood on two legs like a human, but its body was covered with coarse, dark hair. Muscular and hunched over unlike any animal indigenous to these woods. Its eyes were black holes, and a sinister guttural growl rumbled from somewhere within its chest. Frozen in place, neither of us dared move a muscle. The creature snarled and appeared ready to pounce or run. As adrenaline coursed through my veins, I thought back about our lives here in these woods and how things would never be the same again. The standoff between the creature and us seemed to last forever, though it might have been mere seconds. It felt as if danger lurked behind every tree, and that this woods we once found comfort in had turned against us. Staunton glanced at me, and without a word, we both knew we needed help. The only problem was calling for assistance without provoking the creature. We slowly inched away from it, trying to maintain our composure and avoid any sudden movements. The beast stared at us intently but didn't move. Its hulking form cast an ominous shadow, making it difficult to discern any facial features or emotions it might have displayed. Instead, all that emanated from it was a menacing aura and its deep guttural growl that gripped my chest with fear. As Staunton managed to pull his phone out of his pocket and dialed the emergency number, I kept my eyes on the creature, not daring to break eye contact. If it suddenly decided to attack or flee, I needed to be aware. Hello? We need help. There's an, an animal or something in the woods. Staunton whispered urgently into the phone. The operator asked for our location and details about the threat. We're near our cabin in Maple Hollow. It's big, it's covered in hair. I've never seen anything like it. Realizing we were calling for help, the creature let out a deafening roar that shook me to my core. In an instant, it charged towards Staunton with terrifying speed and ferocity. Run! I yelled as fear took over my body. My legs moved on their own as both Staunton and I bolted toward our cabin, desperate for safety. We could hear the heavy footfalls of the creature behind us, pounding ever closer. Somehow, we made it back to our cabin with the beast hot on our heels. As we slammed the door shut and locked it, the creature barreled into the wooden barrier, its immense strength causing the entire cabin to shake. We could hear the splintering of wood as it relentlessly tore at the door. Thankfully, our neighbors had heard our cries for help and arrived just as the creature began its destruction. They had brought their hunting rifles and immediately began shooting at the monster, which elicited screams of both pain and rage. The creature recoiled from the gunfire but didn't flee. Instead, it focused its vengeful attention on our neighbors, some of whom I recognized as fellow searchers for flurry, and viciously attacked them with claws that dug deeply into their flesh. The scene before me was a gruesome cacophony of screams, gunshots, and animalistic snarls. Eventually, driven away by our neighbor's relentless defense, the creature retreated back into the shadows of the woods. The remnants of our once peaceful lives scattered before us, now stained with blood and terror. The authorities arrived shortly after, having received Staunton's panicked call. We recounted our traumatic encounter as best as we could, but there was something about their reactions that led me to believe they were familiar with this malevolent beast. After conducting an extensive search for any trace of Flurry or the creature, they concluded their investigation with no definitive answers. Left only with dreadful memories of our experience and mourning those who suffered horrific injuries in defense of us, Staunton and I couldn't bring ourselves to stay in those woods any longer. In quiet conversations with others involved in this harrowing ordeal, theories were whispered about what we faced, mentioning skinwalkers or shapeshifters as possibilities. But without any true understanding or knowledge of folklore ourselves, 
these ominous words held little meaning for Staunton and me. We will always be grateful for the bravery of our neighbors and hope that they will heal from both their physical and emotional wounds. As for Staunton and me, we will carry the horror of these events with us for the rest of our lives. And though we may never know what the creature was or what made it prey on us, we can only hope that it never finds another opportunity to terrorize anyone else. This happened to me a long time ago. I was visiting the off-the-grid area of Slab City in Southern California, attracted by its reputation as a haven for free spirits and wanderers. My name is Casper Kilgore, and at the time, I was seeking refuge from my monotonous nine-to-five job in an effort to get back in touch with nature. The slabs were filled with like-minded people who wanted to leave their old lives behind. It was here that I met Vespera Stanchfield, a free-spirited artist who had created her own small community within the area called The Nest. We immediately hit it off and spent most of our evenings together, discussing our dreams and life philosophies. One moonlit night, Vespera invited me to explore a nearby cave system she had recently discovered. She said the caves contained mesmerizing artwork left by ancient civilizations. Venturing into the unknown, we armed ourselves with flashlights, canteens, and a few survival supplies. As we delved deeper into the cave system, it became apparent that these works of art were unlike any we had ever seen before. Strange symbols marked the walls alongside human-like figures with elongated limbs and twisted bodies images that seemed as though they clawed at my very being from within my mind. While Vespera remained fascinated by these peculiar designs, I couldn't shake an eerie feeling of unease that enveloped me, pushing me closer to discomfort with each step. In response to my concern, she joked about being secretly initiated into an ancient society. As we continued further into the caverns, we stumbled upon a chamber filled with bones. The sheer number of remains was staggering some fresh and bleeding while others were ancient and fossilized. We realized that it was time to head back immediately as something was definitely amiss. Vesper suggested marking our path as we ventured out so we could inform any future visitors of the horrific sights we had encountered. But as we retraced our steps... An ominous feeling intensified, and my dread grew with every passing moment. The cave seemed to morph around us, and I questioned whether symbols on the walls had always looked so sinister. Suddenly, Vespera was yanked into the darkness by unseen forces. Panicking, I shouted her name, but all that met my ears was a guttural growl that reverberated through the extensive tunnel system. A creature emerged from the shadows, its appearance a horrifying mixture of man and beast, a predator that should not have existed outside nightmares. Its fur was a matted mess of dried blood and dirt, and its unnerving gait sent shivers down my spine. With no cell phone reception in this off-the-grid location and no other way to call for help, we had no choice but to rely on our instincts. I quickly grabbed Vesper's hand and pulled her away from the looming menace as we dashed into another narrow tunnel. Despite being devoid of sunlight, the beast's eyes seemed to gleam like red-hot embers in pursuit. Every time the creature closed in on us, Vesper would spray it with bare repellent we had carried along for safety. The gas managed to deter the creature each time but for a measly few moments. We grew progressively cognizant that our resources were limited as we struggled to navigate through this labyrinth and cave system. By now, I could hear its paws scraping against rock up ahead of us, anticipating its prey's next move. In desperation, we clawed our way up a jagged incline only to end up trapped in a small recess near the ceiling. The echoing growls informed us that we remained in dangerous company. 
hoping it wouldn't detect us if we remained motionless and silent as stones. Our adrenaline-fueled breaths quickened as we watched the creature steadily slink into the chamber. Its sharp eyes scanned the darkness, looking for any indication of our hiding spot. All the while, we hoped that this would be the chance to escape alive. The creature, an abomination with elongated limbs and patches of fur missing, approached cautiously, sniffing the air as it circled the chamber. I watched, my heart pounding in my chest, desperate not to move or breathe too heavily. I could only assume that this fiend was a skinwalker or some shapeshifter of lore, even though I knew hardly anything about folklore. Vespera squeezed my hand tightly. Her knuckles turned white from the tension. Her eyes darted frantically between me and the hideous beast that continued to circle us as it searched for a trace of our presence. We had no choice at this point but to attempt communication with any available ally we could think of, even if we doubted that they would have any method of reaching us. In a desperate whisper, I hissed at Vesper to use her phone's walkie-talkie function, a last-ditch effort to reach out for help in case someone was nearby. She hesitated briefly, fearing that the sound might alert the creature to our location, but ultimately obliged knowing that this may be our only chance at survival. After several agonizing moments that felt like hours, we managed to make contact with a pair of hikers who were miraculously close enough to hear our cry for help. We pleaded for them to rescue us from the clutches of this monster, trying desperately to describe its gruesome appearance without giving away our position. The hikers agreed to assist us and instructed us to create a diversion so they could approach undetected. Suddenly feeling a glimmer of hope, we decided on a plan that would both distract and potentially injure our monstrous pursuer. Relying on her quick thinking, Vespera rolled a heavy rock off the ledge in the hopes that it would not only distract but also possibly wound or stun the creature. The rock thundered down from the recess and smashed onto the ground, sending the beast into a frenzy. As it turned to confront the sudden noise, we saw our opportunity and scrambled down from our hiding place. We sprinted through the cave's narrow corridors with renewed speed, praying that the hikers would arrive soon. The pounding footsteps of the creature in pursuit echoed behind us, confirming that it indeed had not been harmed but was now even more determined to catch us. As we reached a fork in the cave, a familiar voice called out to us from one of the passageways. It was one of the hikers. We followed his instructions and hastily joined them in their corner of the cave system. Together, we all watched as the creature appeared torn between both paths before ultimately choosing ours. The anticipation grew as it approached, its eyes still glinting angrily. But just as it lunged at us, ready to exact its fury on its helpless prey, the second hiker broke from his hiding spot and hurled a lit flare straight into its open maw. The creature stumbled back in agony, releasing an ear-splitting screech. Seizing this window of opportunity, we all made a break for it, sprinting down the tunnel and out into open air. The horror-stricken scream of our pursuer echoed through the walls as we finally collapsed onto solid soil beneath daylight's embrace. With adrenaline coursing through our veins, we looked at each other in disbelief. Our rescuers introduced themselves as Ben and Andrea two experienced outdoors enthusiasts who'd encountered their share of dangers in remote regions but never anything like this nightmarish being. As authorities launched investigations into what had transpired within that godforsaken cave, they discovered nothing more than an empty chamber filled with claw marks and remnants of fur, no remains of any living being to be found. To this day, I shudder to think about those harrowing moments within that labyrinth's dark depths, where I narrowly escaped death's grip. We owe our lives to Ben and Andrea, who thankfully were there when we needed them. The terrifying encounter will forever live in the back of our minds, 
a gruesome reminder of just how fragile life can be. This happened to me a few summers ago in Gaviota, a remote area on the coast of California. My name is Emrys Galloway, and I'm a freelance journalist always up for an adventure. That fateful summer, I decided to join a small group of campers heading out to the thick forests with my best friend, Orla Sweeney. As we hiked to our camping site, everyone exchanged stories and jokes. We were about three miles from civilization when two members of our group, Aramis Prunella and Sidney Saxby, suddenly disappeared while collecting firewood. All five remaining members gathered near the campfire to discuss their mysterious disappearance. As the sun set behind the tree line, a heavy tension settled around us. The wind howled through the cracks in the forest an eerie choir of dissonant voices that sent chills down my spine. Demetrio Neville broke the silence. We need to find them, he urged. We all agreed that we had no choice but to split up into smaller groups and search for our missing friends. Their absence was haunting us as much as the forest itself. With flashlights in hand, Orla and I ventured into the uncharted darkened woods. Every crunching twig underfoot and rustling bush amplified our senses as we pressed on. As hours passed by like minutes, Orla and I came across something neither of us had ever seen before, a massive footprint sunk deep into the damp soil. It seemed almost primal. I snapped a photo with my camera for evidence, trying to wrap my head around what could have made such an imprint. Eventually, Orla stumbled upon a gruesome sight Sidney's lifeless body lay face down in a clearing surrounded by unusually mutilated plants with Aramis nowhere in sight. At this point, our fear escalated, and we frantically decided to sprint back to camp without looking back. As we reached the campsite, Reva Fife and Elliot Utley listened in horror as we detailed our findings. With sorrow and worry gripping us tighter, our small group struggled with the decision to seek help or stay put. Not wanting the rest of the night to be spent in fear and inactivity, we agreed to make our way back towards civilization under the cover of darkness. There was little time for sentiment or shock. All that mattered now was sticking together and getting to safety. While hurriedly packing up our belongings, Demetrio's flashlight caught something moving nearby. The shadowy figure lurking beyond the edge of the campsite was unlike anything any of us had ever seen before. It resembled a creature of pure sinew and muscle with lupin features, yet with an uncanny human-like quality that made it all the more terrifying. The fear became all-consuming as the creature emerged from the darkness, targeting Elliot first with an inhuman agility. Its predatory strength left none of us time to think or react logically, our gathering trip already becoming a sickening fight for survival. The creature moved quickly, lunging at Elliot, who let out a guttural cry of pain. It gripped him tightly with its clawed hands, the pointy talons sinking deep into his flesh. Blood gushed onto the ground as Elliot's body shuddered in agony. Reva, her voice shaking, asked what we should do. The monster was silent, only breathing harshly as it continued to tighten its grip on Elliot, who struggled to free himself from the beast's clutches. I couldn't bring myself to confront this monstrous being but knew we couldn't abandon Elliot. With no idea how to kill the creature or any myths to guide us, I suggested we call for help. The others agreed but I hesitated unsure if help could come in time. As Riva and Demetrio moved away from the campsite to find a signal on their phones, this left me alone with Elliot and the creature. My heart pounded in my chest, desperately seeking a way to evade this horrific situation. The gruesome scene continued to unfold before me, 
Elliot's limb twitches grew weaker by the second and his eyes were filled with terror. Meanwhile, Demetrio was able to call for help but they wouldn't arrive for at least an hour, a realization that filled us with dread. The creature suddenly released its grip on Elliot, who fell unceremoniously onto the forest floor. It then turned its attention towards Riva and Demetrio as they re-entered the campsite unaware of the danger lurking just feet away from them. Incoherent screams left Riva's mouth as she realized what was happening. The creature slinked forward stealthily, leaving me frozen in horror while attempting to figure out what I should do next. As it closed in on Riva and Demetrio, a sudden flash of insight struck me. I could distract the creature long enough for them to escape. With a loud snarl, I lunged at a nearby tree branch. It cracked loudly, drawing the attention of the beast. The creature's head swiveled towards me with an unnerving speed while Riva and Demetrio welcomed this brief reprieve and sprinted away from the campsite. My legs ached as they propelled me farther into the forest, the creature hot on my heels. Branches slapped my face and tore at my clothes. Suddenly, I lost my footing and tumbled down a steep incline before coming to an abrupt stop against a tree trunk. For a moment, the world seemed to pause, but there would be no time to catch my breath. The creature was still pursuing me without missing a beat. I struggled upright with great pain and continued my run for survival. Help finally arrived in the form of several armed officers ready to battle this unknown adversary. They ordered me to stay behind as they moved forward into the forest, guns raised. The officers fought valiantly throughout the night. Their screams rent the air while blasts from their firearms echoed off trees. Slowly, as dawn approached, an eerie silence fell over what remained of our campsite. In the end, there were four victims, Sidney, Elliot, Riva, and Demetrio, the casualties of this nightmare that would leave survivors haunted by our memories forever. It wasn't until later when talking to an officer about possible motivations for these brutal murders did we make some horrifying associations. The creature could have been a manifestation or descendant of something commonly known as a shapeshifter or skinwalker. We might never truly know what haunted us during those grueling hours in that forest, but I hope for clarity, not just for myself but for those who never made it out alive. To find answers will help bring closure to both friends and family who lost their loved ones that night when the nightmare began to unfold within that once tranquil campsite. This happened to me a few summers ago in the secluded forests of the Kootenay National Forest, Montana. My name is Llewellyn Hitchcock, and I'm a photographer by trade but an adventurer at heart. A childhood friend, Ellery Drayton, and I set out on a week-long camping trip to escape our mundane lives. Arriving at our campsite, we found it pristine, deep in the woods, far from any other human presence. We began setting up camp, pitching tents, gathering firewood, all the while exchanging amusing banter. The first evening blurred into relaxing days spent hiking through dense foliage and admiring breathtaking landscapes. It wasn't until the fourth day that our lives turned upside down. Ellery and I crossed paths with another camper named Perdita Fowler, her face pale and terror-stricken. She told us how a monstrous beast had viciously mauled three campers she'd met earlier. They were all dead now. Ellery cracked a weak joke to ease the tension, but it was evident that we were all terrified. Against our common sense, we accompanied Perdita to the gruesome scene. The bodies of Maximilian Bergen and his parents were barely recognizable, mangled beyond belief. My breath caught in my throat as the horror unfolded before my eyes. Suddenly our adventure seemed less enticing. 
We decided to call for help immediately but realized we had no cell phone reception that deep into the woods. Before anything else could be done about it, an eerie growl echoed ominously nearby. Perdita gasped, realizing we weren't alone and whispered that this ferocious creature had leathery skin covered in scales along with dense fur on certain parts. Her words painted an image of something nightmarish. Terrified, we heard leaves rustling as if something large was approaching our way. We started running but not fast enough to keep me from catching a glimpse of the monstrous beast. It was every bit as menacing as Perdita had described. Completely out of breath, we stumbled into an abandoned old hunting shack, hoping to hide from the creature. Inside, we found the battered journal of Ophelia Talcott, a woman who'd sought refuge in the same hut years ago. Her writing detailed her encounter with the beast. The excerpt from the journal described how she'd managed to wound it but only succeeded in enraging it more. Her writings increased my heart rate, alarming me even further. All the while, Ellery attempted to concoct a makeshift spear, holding on to his stubborn smirk as if refusing to bow down to fear. Studying the journal and examining our scarce supplies— we devised a plan to drive back the creature long enough until we could reach safety. Taking turns exchanging theories about the creature's origin would serve as distractions, making our efforts feel less desperate. We speculated that it might be a deformed animal, or a product of human experimentation plausible explanations for something that defied reason. The following evening, all plans were abandoned when a heavy rainstorm hit unleashing furious winds and blinding torrents of rain. In quickening distress, our eyes remained glued to the shack's entrance. The storm only intensified as the night wore on, and any hope of leaving the shack diminished. We huddled together, without saying a word. Our muscles ached from tension as we strained our ears, listening for any signs of the creature outside. The wind howled and branches scraped against the shack's walls, but there was no sign of the beast. In the morning, with eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep, we cautiously ventured out into the rain-drenched surroundings. There was no sign of the creature from the night before, but that only made me more uneasy. It could be anywhere, watching us. Ellery and I discussed our strategy of making it to safety. Our best chance was to exit the woods and cross into an open field that led towards a small town about a mile away. If we made it there without encountering the creature, we could ask someone to call the local authorities and get help. Our trek through the woods was slow and cautious. We constantly scanned our surroundings, trying to remain as quiet as possible. Suddenly, I heard Ellery gasp and my heart leaped into my throat. It looked like a mix between a bear and a wolf, far larger than any animal I had ever seen, with long claws and teeth glistening in its maw. The sight of its warped features struck me with terror. Before I could react or scream, it leaped towards Ellery. I couldn't just run away and leave him to die. So instead of running for safety, my gut instinct told me to grab a large branch from the ground next to me. Swinging wildly at its head, I managed to knock it off balance, giving Ellery enough time to get away from its reach. We both sprinted blindly through grass and mud until we were heaving for breath in an open field. My chest burned with exhaustion. My fear continued pumping adrenaline into my veins. Looking down, I realized that Ellery had been injured during the altercation. He winced in pain, blood oozing from deep gouges in his arm. He clenched his jaw, attempting to suppress tears, and I did my best to help him up as we kept moving. I spotted a wooden fence delineating the border of the small town. Help was near. As we approached, Ellery's injuries seemed to worsen. A woman working in her yard noticed us and called for assistance. I urgently requested someone try to call the police. 
My account of the creature was met with skepticism and disbelief, but what we had gone through was very real and horrifying. The police searched the woods but couldn't find any evidence of the monster or even Ophelia Talcott's journal inside the shack. After giving our statements, Ellery was taken to a hospital for treatment. I still can't shake off the horrifying encounter. No one seems to believe that such a fearsome creature could exist without some logical explanation. I could only make assumptions about this creature's existence. Perhaps it was a skinwalker or a shapeshifter. Yet those possibilities added more questions than answers. I'm no expert on folklore or mysterious creatures. I just wanted to forget about it all and move on. As time goes by, memories of that terror are slowly beginning to fade away. In spite of what we went through together, Ellery never changed, stubborn as ever, an aspect of his personality that granted him strength during our ordeal with the beast, strength which saved our lives that awful night. We've lost contact over time as we both tried to heal, seeking ways of coping with those vivid memories that lurk at the back of our minds. But occasionally we share somber acknowledgement via text message when something reminds us of the attack. To this day, I hold on to that single fleeting act of bravery where I swung a branch to protect my friend, and not choosing the alternative of fleeing when faced with abject terror. While I hope never to encounter such a horrific creature again, the events that transpired in that storm-riddled forest have undoubtedly left an indelible mark on my psyche, reminding me of the power of friendship and instinct even in the face of unspeakable dread.